Good morning, afternoon, and evening, depending on where you are in the world. And thank you all for joining us today. And welcome to the second and final day of the Parasite Biodiversity Day event organized by the Global Parasitologist Coalition. My name is Chen Hua Li. I'm the co-founder of the Global Parasitologist Coalition and the organizer for this event. Global Parasitologist Coalition is a non-profit organization focusing on bridging the interaction and collaboration among parasitologists and organizations worldwide to bring public awareness on parasitology. We're presenting this event in celebration of the UN Biodiversity Conference, COP15, which is being hosted in Kunming, China this year. And the first part is from October 11th to October 15th in this uh, UN Parasite Biodiversity Conference. In our Parasite Biodiversity Day event, we would like to bring people's awareness to parasites and also celebrate the biodiversity of parasites within other organisms. This is the second day of our two-day event. Similar to yesterday, we will have four sessions today. Each will last for about an hour. In addition to our speakers' presentations, we will have a panel discussion as today's first session, Conserving Parasite Biodiversity, Pros and Cons, with Dr. Scalar Hopkins, Dr. Kevin Lafferty, Dr. Mackenzie Quack, and Dr. Michelle Power. Then we will continue with our, our parasite and host session with parasite and host animals with wings presented by Dr. Mackenzie Quack from National University of Singapore and parasite and host animals with pouches presented by Dr. Michelle Power from Macquarie University in Australia and Dr. Stephanie Godfrey from the University of Otka in New Zealand. Last but not least, we will have our Parasite and Art session with the Nobel Laureate Dr. William Campbell, who will share the stories behind his amazing Parasite paintings and his perspective on how art and science inspires one another. We will also have the famous Maguro Parasitological Museum in Japan, giving us a virtual tour to the museum and its collection highlights. We hope you will enjoy today's session and learn some different aspects of parasitology. In case of any issue uh, happens during this event, please email us at info at globalpc.org or leave a comment on the YouTube chat, and we will do our best to help you. Lastly, as a token of our appreciation, we will be awarding a $100 gift card to one of our participants, which will be determined randomly from those who submitted questions to our panel uh, discussion in this session. We will announce the winner at the end of the conference. So now we will start our very first session, the panel discussion on conserving parasite biodiversity, pros and cons. Our panelists are Dr. Scalar Hopkins. Hey, Scalar. Uh, so yeah, I'm Scalar Hopkins. I'm an assistant professor at North Carolina State University. Thank you. And we have Dr. Kevin Lafferty. Hi, Kevin. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Kevin Lafferty. I'm a senior scientist with the United States Geological Survey at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Thank you. And we have Dr. Mackenzie Quack. Hi, Mackenzie. Hello. Um, I'm a parasitologist based at the National University of Singapore. Thank you. And we have our Dr. Michelle Power. Hi, Michelle. Thank you. Hi, Chen Wa. Hi, everyone. Kevin. I'm Michelle Power Hi, from Sydney uh, Macquarie University. Hello, everyone. Thank you. And I want to remind our panel, if one of you are watching the live YouTube, could you please mute the YouTube while you're watching that? Thank you. And thank you all, everyone, for submitting questions for our panel while registering. 
So first, we will go through some of the, those questions. And for the audience who didn't get a chance to write down a question beforehand, or if you are coming up with new questions you really wish to ask our panel, please feel free to leave your questions in the YouTube chat or reply to our Twitter post at Global Parasito One for Global Parasitologist Correlation. Okay, let's begin. At the very beginning, can I ask all of our panels, where are you joining us from and what's the local time there? Skylar, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, sure. I'm in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina in the United States, and it is 8.10 p.m. Pretty late for me. Kevin? I'm on the west coast of the uh, United States in California, and it is 5 p.m. Thank you. Mackenzie? Uh, I'm in Singapore, and it's 8.11 a.m., um, 29 degrees and about 80% humidity. Thank you. Michelle? Uh, yeah, sure. North Carolina in the United States, and it is 8.10 p.m. Pretty late for me. Hello, Dr. Michelle Power, are you there? Sorry, degrees. look, I'm having some mega difficulties here. I might sign off and come back in, um, but I am in Sydney and it's sunny at the moment. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so our first question from our audience is a uh, Corning Ong from the Racing University asked, are parasites getting less diverse or has their biodiversity increased in the last 20 years? Is any of our panel want to jump on to that question? Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll answer anything nobody else wants to answer, that's fine. Right, Skylar? I, I think yeah, uh, I <laughs> the answer is we don't know, but, but that's an important answer simply because there's very little systematic monitoring of any sort of parasite biodiversity anywhere. Um, the little that uh, has been done has shown that, yeah, maybe there are some uh, changes to parasite diversity. Sometimes we see them go up, sometimes we see them go down, but overall there's, uh, we don't have the information and uh, the information that we do have doesn't suggest necessarily uh, a strong trend overall one way or the other, at least certainly not over 20 years. Thank you. Dr. Hopkins, do you want to add on to that? And I think that's the same as I would say. I think there's some like pretty important studies showing declines in parasite biodiversity in some places, but there's no way to know if that's a general global trend. We just don't have enough data to answer that question. Thank you. And our next question is from Susan Quark at University of Calgary. How is climate change influencing parasite distribution? Well, I mean, uh, I work on ticks and ectoparasites, which are particularly uh, nice, sensitive species for this, in some sense, more so than endoparasites, because in many cases, they're these sort of uh, poikilothermic organisms, which whose body temperature fluctuates with the environment, right? So for many species, we're seeing certainly as these warmer latitudes or the, these higher latitudes are getting warmer, we're seeing uh, ticks spreading into zones that we've never seen them before. We're seeing mosquitoes spreading into zones and we're starting to have the emergence of some, some say vector-borne diseases are becoming endemic in zones where previously they've been very, uh, uh, import, they've been sort of imported cases, sporadic cases, but they certainly haven't been persisting there continuously. So certainly for, for some, of, some of those sort of species, we are seeing major changes, uh, particularly for the medically important species, uh, because those are the ones that are monitored, obviously. Um, but yeah, we're certainly seeing changes in that kind of stuff. Um, and then, of course, for, for the, the implication of that is that if you have some particularly sensitive species, ticks are good examples, um, that are threatened, then, of course, they're going to have redistribution uh, under climate change as, say, humidity, mean humidity, mean annual humidity changes, mean monthly humidity changes. 
things like that, yeah. Thank you, Mackenzie. Is any other of our panel want to add on to the question, how is climate change influencing parasite distribution? Yeah, I, would, I would just add that, um, you know, for the most part, the, the general theoretical expectation is that the same thing should be happening to parasites as happening to other ectothermic hosts, which is that we expect their uh, ranges to shift to higher latitudes, like Mackenzie said. Um, some of them won't be able to make that shift. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we might be concerned about parasite conservation for some of these things. Um, when we've looked overall at um, important human parasitic diseases, we, we do find a, um, certainly a, a temperature signal. Um, as the earth has, has warmed, we see uh, uh, hotter places, you know, uh, perhaps having different sorts of parasite responses than colder places. But interestingly, Overall, at least the, the human burden of parasitic diseases has fallen at the same time that um, climate has warmed, not, ha not having anything to do with climate so much, but the fact that as countries have become wealthier, um, the impacts of human infectious diseases have declined. So the, the difficulty of tracking changes over time really is there's so many things happening very fast on this planet and sometimes moving things in opposite directions. Thank you, Kevin. For our next question is from Caitlin Gallagher from Christine Bo uh, Brothers University asked, is there a certain group of parasites that seems to be the most at risk? Scalar, do you want to jump on to this one? So it's, it's also a tricky one. You guys are asking lots of good questions that we don't necessarily have great answers for yet. Um, people have thought about, um, the kinds of parasites just in general, like what sorts of life histories might make parasites especially at risk. And so potentially um, parasite species that are specialists, so they use maybe just one host species or just a few host species, um, they might be at the highest risk, right? Because if their host species disappears, then they don't potentially have another one to use instead. So they might go co-extinct um, along with their host species. Um, so that's like, one thing, um, parasites that have some kind of free living environmental stage might be especially prone to um, sensitivity to changing climate and things like that. So if they have this stage outside of their host where they're just in the environment exposed to those conditions, they might be at higher risk. Um, I don't know if someone wants to jump in about particular taxonomic groups that might be particularly prone to extinction or co-extinction. Dr. Michelle Power, do you want to jump onto this one? Yeah, I might just, just one jumps to mind. I might actually just mention Imeria. So that's the little one you can see behind me there. Um, it has very, even though it's, it doesn't have an intermediate host and it's passed directly from one host to the other, um, it is highly host specific. So if, if, if its host goes extinct, perhaps this particular parasite genus has, has, a, has a higher chance of, of going extinct or becoming endangered. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, I, I would just add to that, that uh, I think probably the two biggest predictors of extinction and parasite, one is, are we trying to drive them extinct? Guinea worm might be one that uh, may be going ex uh, extinct, uh, hopefully, in my opinion. Um, and then, uh, but that also relates to parasites of hosts that may be going extinct. Um, that's the other big risk factor. Um, parasites basically go down with the ship. And uh, if that, so we, we, we ought to be looking at the ships, I think, to make the predictions. Thank you, Dr. Lafferty. For our next question uh, is a question from public. Uh, Ilya Lepkokli, sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, asked, about how many species of parasites are there? Dr. McKenzie Clark, do you want to jump onto this one? Oh, that's a, how long is a piece of string? Is sort of maybe the best answer kind of thing. So, I mean, if we want to just consider the, say, parasites that we sort of parasitologists vaguely study because of historical reasons, which are basically metazoans, like so, so uh, uh, non-bacteria, non-virus, non-archaea organisms, so eukaryotic uh, parasites. Um, if you just want to include that, there's probably millions of species. If you want to include viruses, which certainly are parasitic because they 
obviously need a host cell to reproduce within, then the number goes to probably billions or maybe even trillions, depending on how you want to delineate where your one virus species stops and another virus species uh, starts. Certainly for things like parasitic worms or ticks, we have fairly good ideas of how many we have described and we have general predictions of how many there might be. So for instance, for like uh, uh, helminths, so parasitic worms that live in vertebrates, we've described about 76,000 species roughly. Some estimates say that there may be as many as 300,000 species. So we may have yeah, not even described half of the diversity there. If we go to ticks, we've, we're almost at 1,000. They're not very species rich. And we're, we're probably reaching some kind of plateau in the next few years. But I mean, if we want to start to get into a, a protozoa, then it's just like pick a species, add five, add 10, and then maybe you've got your idea. I don't know how many vertebrate species there are on Earth, but if we're just considering vertebrate parasites, pick that species and maybe times that by five or 10. Maybe you're in the ballpark. I don't know. Maybe Michelle might have a better idea since she's a protozoan sort of person or certainly more of a protozoan person than me. But I mean, we really, really don't know. For some groups, we have sort of vague ideas. Well-studied groups like ticks or mosquitoes, we've got reasonably good ideas. But there's many, many groups that we haven't studied well at all. Tapeworms, nematodes, really, we haven't done nematodes. And all the insect roundworms, so mammithids, nematomorpha, all these groups are very, very poorly studied. There's almost no specialists, so it's, it's very hard to try and even get a gauge, even try and do like rarefaction curves or something to try and predict it. Really, really hard. Nigh impossible. Thank you. I think the other, oh, can, can I, I just add, add something? something? I think the yeah. other thing to add is, is that, um, you know, many years ago before the advent of genetic technologies, we, we used what we would term morphology to describe and identify parasite species. But now we have a wealth of molecular tools and we're actually discovering that parasites are more diverse. So I would say that every day we're probably increasing our understanding of the biodiversity of parasites and how many there are. So it might be hard to even pin down at this point in time because we just don't know. I Thank thought you. I'd just yeah. add that, you know, probably one of the best studied groups for parasites are fishes because we like to catch them and eat them and, you know, on the way we look inside of them. Um, and when we did a survey of parasites of fishes around the world, we what we found was that um, ah, only, sorry about that. Only 12% of fish species have ever been dissected for parasites. So, you know, basically there's, we, we barely scratched the surface for the most commonly studied host group. And, and that uh, should indicate that we're like, like uh, Mackenzie said, you know, at give any number you want, multiply by five, I don't know what it is, but we're, we're, we just haven't looked hard enough yet. But these molecular tools, hopefully Michelle will make it easier to do that. At least that's what I'm hoping for the next generation of parasitologists. Thank you, Kevin. So for our next question is an imaginary question from Gonzala Eline. Asked, what would a world without parasites look like? Dr. Skylar Hopkins, do you want to jump onto that one? Uh, we really need Chelsea here to answer that question, um, but I will do my best Chelsea impersonation maybe. Um, so, uh, Part of the answer is that we don't know, right? We're not sure what a world without parasites would look like. I think maybe all the questions that we got asked today, we're gonna to say we don't really know uh, what would happen. We do think that that world might look a lot different, right, than, than what we have today. So um, parasites do really important things in ecosystems. So they control host populations, including pest species. Um, so it's just one example. We know that parasitoid wasps are worth billions of dollars in agricultural benefits to people every single year. They say there's billions of dollars in controlling pests that we would otherwise have to control with pesticides or something else. So if we got rid of all of those, then our agricultural landscape would look really different than it does today. Um, we also know that parasites move energy through ecosystems um, in ways that we didn't really know about until you know, the past couple of decades, especially with some of Kevin's work. Um, and so if we lost those species, you know, we, we, we would lose those paths through ecosystems. The way that energy moves through those systems um, would be different. I don't think we can say exactly what that different world would look like, 
Um, we don't really have any place in the world that we can go and say, look, here's a place that doesn't have any parasites and this is how that place looks, right? And that's probably a good thing because parasites are playing those important roles. So it's good that we have them everywhere. Thank you, Dr. Hopkins. Dr. Michelle Power, do you want to add on to that? Yeah, I might add two things there. I think it's interesting to note that um, you know, some parasites do protect the host from invasion of other pathogens and so and also prime the immune system. So there's some protective nature there. So I guess health of whatever host has the parasite could be compromised in some way. But equally, there's the flip side, and, and I know we're kind of talking a lot about conservation, but if we think about human health, you know, parasites such as plasmodium that cause malaria is having a huge global human health, well, human health issue. Or, and um, many parasites, you know, children in developing nations, many children have greater than five parasites um, that they're carrying at any time. So if we lose parasites from their negative benefit, we might, might see some improvement in host health as well. Thank you, Dr. Power. For our next question, we have from Maria Eleanor Arolando asking, conserving parasites seems to contradict the eradication interventions that have been put in place. How do we know whether it's better to conserve or eradicate a parasite? Dr. Leiferty, do you want to explain that? I, I think that it's, um... Firstly, this whole argument about conserving parasites, it's easy to frame from the perspective of privileged, healthy people in Western countries that don't have to watch their children get sick from parasitic infections. And so I think that um, when I'm asked this question, I want to make it very clear that um, I have never really advocated for conserving human parasites, or especially ones that, that cause um, suffering. Um, so if I think from that perspective, there doesn't necessarily need to be a conflict between conserving parasites that are normal parts of natural systems um, in the same way that we choose to conserve predators in those systems, um, you know, for various reasons. I think it's also possible in many cases you can conserve tigers, but without uh, having tigers that eat, you know, everybody in your neighborhood, right? So there are ways that we may be able to uh, accommodate even some parasites that, that uh, occasionally infect humans. Thank you. Dr. Hopkins, do you want to add on to that? And I totally agree that um, we should continue to try to eradicate parasites that are infecting people and causing um, morbidity and mortality. I think sometimes it's helpful to think about the scale of things. So there might be, you know, something like, you know, 2,000 parasites and pathogens that infect people like ever, um, maybe a little bit less than that. Um, but as Mackenzie just told us, maybe there are millions of parasites, right, um, just out there in the world. And so um, the numbers that infect people are a very, very small proportion. Um, and uh, actually, probably most of us in this panel, right, spend a big chunk of our day jobs trying to figure out how to control those parasites. Um, so we're all on board with that. We want people to be healthier um, and improve their well-being generally. But that doesn't mean that we also need to eradicate all of those other parasite species in the world that don't infect people. Can I, can I make a dissenting view? But hear me out. So initially you might think, oh, he's a, a privileged so-and-so in his ivory tower looking down on the rest of the world. I am strongly against the idea of parasite eradication, permanent eradication. So we obviously, I think everybody agrees, we have to eradicate, if we can, parasites, certainly from the developing world and, and, and parasites of human health. But for some pathogens, certainly in the past, we've eradicated them from the human population, but we haven't eradicated them completely. We still have their genetic data, or in the case of smallpox, we have RNA data, which is useful. We still keep them in labs. So I would propose a smallpox doctrine, essentially which is we absolutely should not eradicate guinea worm. Definitely not. This is an organism which has spent millions of years manipulating the mammalian immune system and the nervous system to some extent. So to lose this wonderful treasure chest of different proteins and different molecular pathways is a tragedy. These are potentially useful drugs. 
This is a whole treasure chest. There's not many parasites. Of all the parasites on earth, very few of them have evolved to, to modulate our immune system and our body. These are treasures. They're very rare. So we absolutely should remove guinea worm from the human population. But much like smallpox, we should maintain in vitro populations. We certainly know now as, as data is coming out from Africa, as they're trying to get the last traces of guinea worm, we're finding that, oh, look, they can reproduce in dog hosts and they can do the whole life cycle as long as they have a dog, a canine as a definitive host. So we, in, in theory, we can actually keep parasites like this. If, if we have the chance to keep them in, say, either a non-human host or if we want to do what we do with mosquito colonies in universities and pay some students to roll up their sleeves and be hosts for us, of course, we can potentially do that if the price is right. But I mean, I would argue that we should eradicate parasites from human populations, but we should not cause their extinctions. We must not let any parasites, certainly human parasites, ever go extinct because they are rare treasure chests full of potential biopharmaceuticals, which could cure many, many of our ills, especially increasingly serious things like autoimmune diseases, which is like, if you want to look at the plague of the developed world, it's autoimmune diseases and allergies. So these are things which we know can have major impacts on, on those kind of uh, nasty diseases, those non-infectious diseases. So I would say, don't eradicate parasites, just remove them from the human population. There's my dissenting, my nuanced dissenting view. Can, can, can I, I just, just clarify something in here as well? Um, I think when we talk about parasites we, and, and what many of us do in our careers is we work on parasites. So eukaryotic organisms, protozoa, all those macro parasites such as nematodes and, and tapeworms. But then we, there's a whole suite of organisms representing um, different taxonomic lineages and they lead a parasitic way of life. So maybe just defining parasitism and what are parasites as well um, is worth um, the audience knowing. Thank you. Does any of our, our panel want to add on to that point? Yeah, I, I think it's worth mentioning if we don't get to it earlier that we've already done this thought experiment in his, historically, um, probably several times, but certainly with the condor louse where uh, veterinarians decided to drive a parasite that did not harm its host to extinction and did so intentionally. So, you know, faced with uh, this sort of moral dilemma about what to do, um, you know, that it was... Uh, we, we see what we what uh, we as conservation biologists have done in the past, and it's going to be interesting to see if there's a change in our perspective going into the future. But that, you know, that was just 30 years ago, really. So, um, Skylar, do you have uh, more to say about that sort of intentional extinction that's already happened? No, I think um, I'm going to totally forget the details of this study. Wasn't there something that just came out about accidentally? The China study? on the yeah. ibises ibises right yeah where yeah, they yeah. i think they accidentally conserved the parasites along with the host so that was like the reverse exciting story where they brought these birds into captivity and accidentally didn't eradicate their parasites so that was a fun story increasingly so so i consult for the singapore zoo here and look at their parasite cases <clears throat> we come across so many co-endangered parasites like things that are really critically endangered like little nematodes that are host specific in like Myanmar, special Myanmar tortoises and things. So zoos probably around the world, especially the sort of more grubby zoos, I'm not trying to cast shade on Singapore Zoo, but like they're, they're, some of their animals have some parasites, not that that's necessarily a bad thing. But zoos, if we went and actually wanted to try and quantify this, it wouldn't actually be that hard, I would suggest, to simply go to zoos, sample all the animals, vets are already pulling out all these worms anyway, and work out what proportion of extra bonus surplus species the zoos are accidentally saving because maybe they were lazy on their ivermectin treatment this month on the pandas or something. So they're, they're probably actually doing quite a lot of it. It's just occurring sort of, it's this hidden conservation, this shadow conservation that's being done by people that don't intend to do it and don't particularly care about parasites anyway, but by sheer luck or laziness or stupidity or something, they're saving a whole bunch of other species that would otherwise be completely extinct ex situ. I think we're also making the assumption and flying with the definition that a parasite harms, at host, harms its host. 
you know, some parasites have evolved with its host for many millions of years, and now they've moved more to a symbiotic interaction where perhaps the harm only comes about when there's some sort of stress on those hosts. And so until we know whether the parasites are actually having a detrimental effect, you know, just because they belong to a taxonomic group of parasites doesn't necessarily mean they're now and continue to cause harm to those particularly endangered hosts or wildlife. Thank you, Dr. Power. Okay, let's move on to our next question. Danielle Gaftson from the Institute of Zoology Guangdong Academy of Science in China asking, assuming that there are no problems preserving a host species, can all its parasites be preserved? How much effort is too much effort to preserve a host specific parasite? Any of our panel want to jump in? I think many of them can be conserved very easily. Where you come into trouble is when you're having things like fish that have these, or like birds that have these like multi-intermediate host trematodes and things that are really, really hard to get the, the mojo right for, for ensuring that that life cycle is uh, being undertaken. But if you have, say, a, a, a parasite that has a single host species, like, um, say, lice on Chinese ibises, then it's reasonably easy to protect them for, for lots of these species, especially ex situ. Um, but I mean, to say like how much effort is too much effort is kind of, a, it's a lazy answer and it's kind of a, a bit of a rude answer to, to give you, but how long is a piece of string? How much money do you want to throw at it? China is really happy to throw literally tens of millions of dollars at pandas. Pandas are like, maybe my fellow panelists will dissent here. But as far as species go, I'm very unimpressed with pandas. And I know maybe that's a cliche that many of us biologists hate pandas. I really hate pandas. They don't do very much. They're not very useful. They're like a dead end lineage. They're like a, a what do you call them? Uh, like a, a dead lineage walking. They're like decreasing, decreasing, decreasing in diversity over the millennia. So they're like kind of gone, but people are willing to throw literally hundreds of millions of dollars at their conservation. Um, and, and if you took that money, $100 million, say per year or something, you could save like all of Indonesia's songbirds. You could like forever kind of thing. So it's kind of like, what do we uh, emotionally want to protect kind of thing? If people want to protect parasites, go for it. I will absolutely support that. But I don't know if there's a hard and fast number of like, if it costs less than $10,000, we should do it or something. I don't know. Um, but I think many of them specifically host specific species that just utilize one host. So like host specific fleas, host specific ticks. There are some host specific, say pinworms that have this direct transmission. Those kind of things are really, really easy to save. And basically it costs nothing to do it. All you have to do is keep the host and don't treat them with parasiticides. Don't give them ivermectin and that's it. And then you just leave them gel. If the, you can do fecal egg counts and you can just check that the, say the pinworms aren't building up to ridiculous levels where you're starting to see some kind of pathology or like ill health effects. But other than that, as long as you can just keep an eye and just check they're not increasing to these like sort of ridiculous numbers, then it's like just bonus conservation. It's two or three species for the price of one. It costs you almost nothing. For the other complicated species, trematodes, man, good luck. Like they're not really conducive very well to ex situ conservation. So it's very much about protecting habitat, protecting the integrity of your ecosystems, which is a lot easier said than done, I would say. Thank you, Dr. Park. Go ahead, Dr. Yeah. Hopkins. I'll add, uh, I'm not gonna say whether I love pandas or not because I don't want those emails in my inbox, but a little bit ago, Kevin and I were thinking about parasites of charismatic megafauna. So you would think that because pandas are so well studied that we would know all of their parasites, right? We would know every parasite that infects them, the normal levels that they experience and things like that. Um, but a review paper came out not too long ago that said we actually know very little about the parasites in pandas. Um, so, for example, there's this Billy's Ascaris that they thought um, might be detrimental to pandas, but no one's actually really sure if it's harmful to the pandas or not. Um, I think they have like a mite specific to their faces, which could be problematic. And so they studied that a little bit. But otherwise, it's really unclear, like what the full suite of parasites are that infect Panda. So even this species that is super well studied, we just don't know what the parasites are. So it's really hard to think about how we might conserve them because we're not even sure 
what is there or what used to be there in the wild before we started to have such a large captive influence on them. Thank you, Dr. Hopkins. Dr. Lafferty, do you want to add on to that? Well, I, I just want to echo, I think, what uh, Mackenzie said, which is that really parasite conservation is mostly about host conservation. Um, if you can get that right, that's that's step number one. Step number two, parasite conservation is mostly about not driving parasites extinct. So uh, if you just uh, take your foot off the gas in terms of how, how much you're trying to uh, run over the parasites, then then you then we're, we're most of the way there. I, I don't think that we're um, likely to be in a situation where we are setting up parasite recovery programs in laboratories and doing captive breeding, uh, at least that I don't think that's going to be a common thing in my generation, uh, at least, uh, you know, but I think we're better off focusing on keeping the hosts in proper habitat or even in zoos uh, with their uh, parasites in place. Um, it is true that Trematodes are a pain in the ass, but there, you know, there, there are domesticated life cycles that people have figured out for Biomphalaria and Schistosoma and, and others. Uh, uh, so it's not impossible. In fact, that's one of the things that that classically trained parasitologists do the best is figure out how to keep some of these uh, life cycles in the lab. Um, but I will say, having I, I have, I think I have failed at almost every one that I've tried to do. So no, it, it is really hard. <laughs> Thank you. For I would our say there's one glimmer of hope. No, I completely agree with Kevin that like looking for people to do recovery projects is just like not going to happen pretty well. There is one glimmer of hope, which is the uh, European medicinal leech, which in the UK, where almost everything's threatened, they have um, got a recovery program for that working with one of their zoos and they have a leech spotting uh, team of citizen scientists that go out and monitor these medicinal leeches. I think they go and sort of wait around and wait for the little they choose to slither, swim towards them through the water, and they do captive breeding and release. Um, so, I mean, there's at least one, which is to me a slight light at the end of the tunnel, and maybe that light will grow in coming decades as we add three more recovery programs for the 10, 20, 30, 100,000 threatened parasitic species. But at least there might be, at least it might triple or quadruple in the next decade. I don't know. But someone's at least trying to do it at a very a basic level, which is kind of nice. Thank you. For our next question, Mona Law asked, what are the biggest challenge to maintain a parasite life cycle in the lab? Will we ever see a live parasite zoo? Dr. Michelle Power, do you want to jump onto that one? Ah, uh, that's a that's a challenging question there. <laughs> um, so will we ever see a parasite zoo? Um, look, I think when we do open days and there are some parasites that we can easily culture in the laboratory, such as Giardia, they're fantastic to look at down the microscope. They've got these little flagella, they're little pear-shaped organisms. Um, you know, where we can culture um, parasites, sure, we might see them showcased at various events. I'm not sure if we'll ever see a parasite zoo. We've got a poo zoo here in Australia, which is a step closer to a, a parasite zoo, I guess, or a museum. Um, and we've also obviously got the Parasite Museum in Japan. The complexity, I think, comes in that, and this links back to, the, to some of the other questions, you know, we've just said we don't know how many parasites there are, but we also don't completely understand parasite life cycles and maintaining um, parasites in laboratories or artificial settings requires a full understanding of those life cycles and mimicking each stage. So it can get a bit complex if there's multi hosts in a parasite's life cycle. Thank you. For our next question, we have up, uh, from Gabrielle Doran, uh, upon habitat loss, many generalized species thrive and specialized usually go extinct. What would we expect under these conditions, ecologically speaking? Dr. Scaler, do you want to jump onto that one? I think that's a Kevin question, actually. Dr. Lafferty. Uh, Skyler, you're passing the buck. Um, yeah, so uh, firstly, I'll say that that is a totally reasonable hypothesis, and there are, it's a very complex, uh, you know, parasite life cycles and biodiversity and their relationship 
are very complicated. It's difficult to make, I think, overly simplistic predictions. What we, um, I think what we, we generally expect is that as biodiversity declines amongst hosts, we're gonna see winners and losers amongst the parasites that they have. Um, some of the parasites are not gonna be able to hang on and persist and others are, are gonna find themselves um, in hosts that are doing really well because those hosts have lost their predators or they've lost their competitors. And, and so um, understanding which parasites are gonna be winners and which ones are gonna be losers is another key for um, planning for parasite conservation um, because those winners are gonna do fine just on their own and uh, being able to predict which uh, parasites are actually going to be um, you know, likely to uh, decline in the future is, I think it's, it's really not that difficult. It's, it's just good ecology and good parasitology put together can help make those predictions. So it's, when I say it's complicated, I don't mean it's intractable. I just mean it's not a simple one answer or the other. Thank you. And then Brent Homeless asked, with increasing rate of extinction, are there any trends to suggest that parasites are switching to less vulnerable hosts as an adaption method? Dr. Hopkins, do you want to take on this one? Ooh, I think the answer is gonna again be that we don't really know. Um, I know that um, there's some evidence of um, like feather, mites, feather mites in birds. What's Jorge's work about? Is it mites or is it lice? Um, but there is some host switching that mites. happens. Is it? Yeah. Um, so, you know, we do have evidence that um, parasites can do this host switching, right? So um, as their host species seem to be becoming rare um, over time, like in evolutionary history, um, sometimes they can jump ship and use another more common host species. I don't think that we have a lot of evidence of that happening overall. So um, as we're experiencing massive biodiversity loss of host species, I don't think we really have any idea of like what proportion of species are able to make it um, parasite species onto more generalistic hosts. Um, there is this really cool study that um, is about ancient moa. So these giant flightless birds that lived in New Zealand um, and they've gone back and looked at um, ancient uh, DNA in fossilized species from the MOA to see all the parasite species that those MOA used to have, and then compare it to the parasite species that we know um, still exist in New Zealand in other birds that survived um, those extinction events till today. And we see that some of the species that the MOA had um, still exist today in present day New Zealand, but lots of them went extinct. So it seems like, yes, yeah, sometimes there is this host switching, but it's a little bit hard to predict when it's going to happen. Um, and it probably needs to be hosts that are like relatively closely taxonomically related um, for those switches to happen. We had an interesting study here that we did in uh, findings that we found when we were doing some work on ticks. Um, and we found that we had this it's kind of a common sort of promiscuous uh, tick that feeds on many, many small mammals called Isodes granulatus, the Asian rodent tick. And within Singapore's main island, we only find it in beautiful, almost pristine forests. So very old secondary forest or primary forest of which we have very little because almost the whole island is cleared. And we did, we did sampling in scrubland. We did sampling, uh, sampling in young secondary forest but we only found it on Radis anundulae in the anundulae's rat in these really, really pristine habitats. And we couldn't figure out, or, or, or we made the assumption, this must be this like specialist of these deep, pleasant, humid forests. And then someone really irritated us because we went back and we found back in 2006, somebody found it in young secondary forest on Rattus ratus, the like ship rat, living on this like reclaimed island in Singapore as well. We don't know why it did this, he suggested, this, this chap suggested that maybe it was because uh, it got there and there was no other hosts. And so it just had to make do with what it had. And then through selective pressure, this thing has specialized to, to deal with these much more dry open forests and these uh, somewhat unnatural hosts to some extent. So things can definitely switch, but typically the things that we see switching are things that already have uh, sort of polyzenic host preferences. So, so species that are already feeding on lots of species. So maybe they feed on 10 species. So adding a, an 11th to that is not really an issue for them. They've already got a lot of the 
the biomechanical or biochemical pathways to deal with quite diverse, say, host immune responses and, and things like that. We also see the same thing with, with guinea worm. People were sort of like, okay, well, for years we burden, we labored under the assumption that it's this human parasite and you get it out of humans. You, you stop women particularly and, and, and young men and things. People going down to the water to soothe the, the worm that's coming out of their leg that's causing this massive irritation. You keep them away from the water. It doesn't deposit its eggs. You don't have the cycle uh, going over again. And then they started finding it in dogs when they thought it had been cleared from all these places. And suddenly it's reappearing and the dogs are going down to the water. So things, these, these things sometimes we discover have much more broad host preferences than, than we would have liked to assume at the start. But particularly the species that are going to be host switching much more are the polyxenic species with lots of host, with, with a broader host uh, preference. But unfortunately, those are typically not the ones which are threatened with extinction. Um, so it kind of it kind of goes back to what Skylar was talking about with the, the mowers of like, yes, some things persisted, but like the majority of mower stuff is all gone. Almost all the roundworms and, and trematodes and things are absolutely lost because there were these mower specialists and they just couldn't hack it. There was nothing else that was phylogenetically close enough that they could exploit its immune system without getting pac manned and just absolutely eradicated. Thank you, Dr. Quack. Uh, for the interest of time, I think we can take one or two more questions. So for the next one, it's from Ruby McKenna, asking, keeping in mind the potential for disease transfer and new host associations, when translocating animals, should we be translocating their parasites as well? Dr. Power, do you want to jump onto that one? I think, yeah, um, it comes back to... I would say yes, because we don't necessarily know how those parasites, removing those parasites are going to impact those hosts in the ecosystem. So, so I think we have to think about any animals that we start moving around as a system um, and what they contain. You know, if we talk about are we going to eradicate their parasites or not translate their parasites, what about all the other microorganisms that they carry and that they've acquired in unnatural settings? So if they've been bred in captivity, their whole microbial flora will be completely different to an animal in the environment. So, so I think it might be, you know, I think we need to think about how we go about that and what organisms, how we study the symbionts of a, a species that we are going to begin translocation on. Are there, you know, counterparts of that species in the location they're going to? And really kind of do ecosystem risk analyses to, to determine in different scenarios whether we translocate all their parasites or not. That's my response there. Thank you. Dr. Hopkins, do you want to add on to that? Thanks. So for the next question is from Emily Zins asking what is new and what is there to look forward to in field of parasitology? Dr. Kevin Laverty, do you want to jump to that one? I am I am the exactly the wrong person to ask this question. I asked one of the young people. You've seen it all. So you should you should know what the what it was <laughs> like horrible years ago. I think the molecular age is, is very exciting. We're finally now getting to a point where we have really high throughput sequencing. So you can, like, I mean, with things like we have these nano, nano core sequencing, which is basically a little sequencer that's the size of your smartphone. They now have little, uh, what do they call them? Dongles, which is like a, a small flow cell. So it means literally that the flow cell costs 90 bucks. So I can basically sit in my room on my armchair here. I don't have to leave my room at all, and I can sequence my entire parasitome. I'll go and collect what's ever in the toilet. I can sequence everything. I can sequence 100 specimens, and I can DNA barcode them, and then I can compare them to these massive databases appearing online. So we really now have really cheap, really reasonably good high throughput. So if we want to do molecular stuff and say barcoding, finding new species, working out what parasites are in what snails, it's so cheap now. And the fact that it is so cheap and so easy to use means that we can democratize science much more than we have. So increasingly, uh, de places, developing countries, someone sitting in like a lab in like Bhutan or sitting in some really underfunded lab in Mongolia or something, they can do this. 
really, really cheaply. They can now be performing at like very similar levels with like very inexpensive technology as people at Harvard or Stanford or, or Oxford doing really high, through, high throughput, great sequencing. So the democratization of parasitology in the molecular age, I think is a really, really great, exciting thing. And the fact that we have such big databases online now of, of many parasite species barcodes, we have transcriptomes, we have proteomes. So we're starting to find out, we're starting to have the tools that we can actually work out what's going on inside parasites. We can work out who the players are on the stage and we can do it super cheaply. And almost anyone can do it. If you want to do it, you can buy one of these. Like it costs a, a few hundred bucks to do. You can do it from your back room. You don't have to leave your living room, which I think is fantastic. It's really, really, I find it very exciting. We're finally getting into the point of not trying to get data. We have so much data now that we need to work out which data should we be using? How should we be analyzing it? Which is a very rare opportunity for whole organism biologists and ecologists that normally are like, man, I just want to get one data point. I spent all day hiking. Give me one data point. Now we have billions of reads to play with, DNA reads. So I think the democratization of parasitology with this new technology, really cheap sequencing technology, great databases online, very exciting. But don't let me don't let me hug the time. Thank you. Is there any other thing you want to share to the audience, Dr. Hopkins? Uh, I think that was really great coverage. Um, I think no one in this panel is like particularly young. Um, we might be sort of early careers still, but um, people who are even more early career than me, I think are very interested in the new molecular tools. I certainly have recruited grad students who have those skills because I think that they're very exciting and that they're gonna be very useful to us um, in the near future. Another thing that I'm personally really excited about is starting to use parasites as tools for host conservation. So if we study parasites, what can we learn about the host species that those parasites infect? Can we learn things about um, the host health? Can we learn things about the host abundance and distributions and the way that global change is affecting the host species? Um, so those are things that I think are really exciting for young parasitologists to start thinking about. Thank you. Dr. Michelle Power. Yeah, and look, I agree. Molecular tools are changing the way um, we understand interactions between organisms. I think it's important to also consider that whole organism biology and not just focus. It's not all about the DNA sequence. Um, I think one of the exciting fronts for me, you know, I work on wildlife, one health, host parasite interactions. And I think, um, you know, we'll now start to see wildlife more on the agenda. Uh, through the emergence of coronavirus. And now we might start to get to see other organisms, um, non-viral agents, so parasites, getting more light with wildlife studies and that whole kind of mix of the molecular component coming in there and relationships across species. So I think that's pretty exciting for the future as well. Thank you. Dr. Lafferty? You know, um, about... 30 or so years ago, I, I sort of started this personal quest to get ecologists to understand that, that parasites were interesting and, you know, do that more in the work. And I would go to, you know, the Ecology uh, uh, Society of America meetings and, and give talks about parasites and, and they wouldn't have sessions to put my talk because there, you know, it was, the, I was always in the miscellaneous uh, Friday afternoon session or something. And, um, and so for me, what's been really fascinating to see over the last few decades is how interested ecologists are in infectious disease, conservation biologists also. Um, and so I'm, I'm very pleased that that has happened. On the other hand, what, what does worry me a little bit is that most of those Ecologists and conservation biologists do not have access to formal training in parasitology because most universities just simply do not teach the subject outside of perhaps a medical or veterinary uh, survey course. And so I, I hope that um, as we move forward in various fields that we can um, we can we can enjoy the the new shiny object of the molecular technology, which is really wonderful, but that we can also keep the uh, what is now considered quite old fashioned, uh, you know, whole organism parasitology, zoological, zoological approaches uh, to things, at least in the curriculum, so that people know what to do with those sequences when they start reading them off of their computer. 
Thank you, Dr. Lafferty. And in the interest of the time, this will be the end of the session. And uh, thank you to all of our panelists for a great session and discussion. And thanks to all of you audience asking great questions and for watching. Hope you have more perspective or thoughts on parasite conservation. Uh, so since it's already seven o'clock, sorry, we're not going to take any break. We're going to directly shoot for our next session, which is uh, the parasite and host animals with wings presented by Dr. Mackenzie Kwak, who's one of our panelists. So yeah, thank you all for our panelists and bye here. And welcome. welcome to this section of the conference, and thank you for tuning in. Um, so, for the next sort of half an hour or so, I'm going to try and convince you of why bat parasites are incredibly fascinating, incredibly uh, diverse, and most importantly, why they need our protection and our help. Um, so the title of this talk is Menagerie of a Vampire, The Bizarre Parasites of Bats. And before we get really going, I think it's probably important that I introduce who I am and what I sort of do and, and why it's worth listening to me about the fascinating world of bat parasites. Um, so my name is Mackenzie Kwok. Uh, I'm based at the National University of Singapore in the Department of Biological Science there, and I'm a parasitologist. So most of my research is uh, looking at yeah, parasites. So we spend time in the field, we spend time in the lab, we do genomics-y stuff, um, we do field sampling um, and in silico analysis. And a lot of that is sort of directed towards uh, three sort of major uh, of research areas. One is the impact of anthropogenic changes on parasites. So these are looking at things like changes in climate, changes in land use, the invasion of species, the extinction of species, and how that affects parasite communities, their functioning, their diversity, abundance, and things like that. The next general area we look at is uh, species discovery and systematics. So if we're going to do any of this kind of uh, looking at impacts sort of studies, we need to actually put uh, names to faces so a lot of our work is also looking, or a lot of my work is also looking at uh, discovering and describing and naming new parasites and trying to work out where they fit into uh, the classification of life on earth. The third area we look at is ticks and tick-borne diseases, which of course is an increasingly uh, important area as uh, ticks, ticks, ticks and tick-borne diseases are, are recognized as greater threats to public health globally. And finally, uh, I spent a bit of time looking at sort of an emerging area, which is parasite conservation biology. And most people sort of say, ugh, why would we want to bother saving parasites? But of course, they have a lot of uh, impacts on our ecosystems as regulators of, of populations. Um, they also have uh, utility to humans as uh, sources of biopharmaceuticals. So they've spent a long time modulating our immune systems and our nervous systems. Uh, so there's all sorts of there's all sorts of compounds within this treasure trove of potential pharmaceuticals which could help alleviate mankind's ills. Uh, so we need to protect those species so that we don't lose any of those useful ecosystem services or the useful services they might have for human health. But let's jump into bats, shall we? Before we uh, start to think about bat parasites, we need to actually think about bats and where they came from. So this lush ecosystem here is uh, a landscape during the Miocene. So this is just after the dinosaurs went extinct, or this is some millions of years after the dinosaurs went extinct. Um, during the Miocene, the Earth is essentially a greenhouse environment. So there's very, very little snow or ice at the poles. The temperature is relatively or significantly more uniform um, across the latitudes compared with today, for instance. And so the earth is this big, wet, warm forest. 
Uh, of course, that's not everything, but I mean, a lot of it is a big wet warm forest. And during this period, this is when we find the first bat fossils, the first fossils of what we consider sort of modern bats. Um, and in this uh, illustration here, you can actually see in the top left-hand corner, you can see a number of small bats perched up there in the tree. Uh, so this is the kind of ecosystem that bats are first starting to sort of uh, ma massively diversify within. And of course, as the bats are diversifying, the parasites are diversifying with them. So where did bats come from exactly? So bats seem to, or the, the paleontological evidence seems to suggest that bats originate from some sort of arboreal mammal ancestor um, that seems to have developed uh, some proclivity for gliding and that gradually over evolutionary time, um, they've become more and more confident over generations. They've become more and more competent at it to the point where we go from this uh, sort of small arboreal mammal into these small flying arboreal mammals, which are our modern bats. Of course, gliding and, and, and the sort of transitional forms that we see, this sort of gliding habit is not, uh, not terribly rare in the mammal family tree. So it's actually evolved. Certainly, we certainly have representatives that engage in this gliding and have convergently evolved this similar form of getting around the treetops and the canopy three independent times at least. So uh, one species we have here in Southeast Asia, where I'm based, uh, are the Kalugos, which are their own very, very unique lineage um, of mammals. Uh, and that's the top illustration you can see there. Then where I'm from originally, Australia, we have another group of these gliding mammals, which are, we call them sugar gliders. They, they also have other members in the group like greater gliders, yellow-bellied gliders. Uh, some people call them uh, gliding phalanges, so gliding possums. Um, and so they're actually marsupials. And then the final group of modern flying mammals we have are squirrels, which are of course rodents. And the, the, there, are, there are many different species of uh, flying squirrels. It's clearly been a very, very successful adaptation. But you can kind of see uh, these species are, I mean, they're not the ancestors of bats. They're not necessarily very closely related to bats, but they're employing a similar method of getting away, uh, around to what has been hypothesized as the ancestors of bats may have been doing uh, before they transitioned to true flight, powered flight, versus what these species are doing, which is essentially gliding. So it's, it's not true flight. So why exactly are bats such excellent hosts for such a shocking diversity of parasites? When I say shocking, I mean shockingly good diversity of parasites. So one reason why they're so good is that they have very highly social uh, communities, very highly social uh, populations. So bats will spend a lot of time uh, roosting together, talking to each other, grooming each other in some cases. Um, so because they're spending so much time in, in close proximity, parasites have a chance to move around uh, on different individuals and for the populations to get large because they have this big food source and particularly for ectoparasites, having a lot of uh, individuals in close contact is very good. And anybody who's ever had children at school when there's a, a louse outbreak or a lice out, an outbreak of lice will know how quickly ectoparasites like lice can spread amongst children, which are very highly social and touching each other and in very close contact. Um, and it's the same with bird, uh, bats. So bats are spending a lot of time in close contact. And so of course, it's a, a very good system for parasites to be diversifying and living in because they've got all these available hosts. And you can see in this uh, image of this particular slide, you can see one small uh, bat fly climbing on the face of one of the bats in this image. Well, I mean, it's, it's small by bat fly standards, but it's, it's quite large compared with that bat there. Another driver of the great diversity of parasites within bats is the fact that they engage in, many species engage in multi-species roosting. So in many mammal species, you'll typically have one species within a, a den or a dray or a burrow or a warren or whatever sort of uh, space the, the, the mammal is, is resting and sheltering in. In the case of bats, often you'll have multiple species within one cave or one hollow or within the, say, attic or, or roof of a house. And so when you have multiple species roosting together, the chances that parasites 
can jump from one species to another and then potentially diversify from their uh, other members of the species is, is reasonably good. Um, so you're bringing these species together and then you're splitting them apart as these host species are coming together and moving apart during their roosting behavior. And so over millions of years, that's a great way to uh, sort of drive speciation. And so you get many, many species of parasites on bats because they have such close contact uh, with other bat species. And so it's a good opportunity for these parasites to jump off and diversify. Another factor which drives uh, the high diversity of parasites on bats is the high roost fertility of bats. So bats are typically wed to their, their roosting area surprisingly well, and many of them will return, in some cases over generations, to a single cave where the entire population will live in some places, and you'll have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of bats in some cases, all using this same cave for generations and generations. Of course, some bats will move around throughout the year, certainly in southern Australia. Uh, we know that the bats will use different hollows depending on the season, so they can more carefully regulate their body temperatures during their torpor period. So when they, it's, torpor is somewhat like hibernation. So when they drop their body temperature down, they wanna be somewhere that's nice and cool uh, during that winter rest period when food is very low. So they will move a little bit, but many bats will, will come and revisit the same cave or hollow nesting area over and over again. So if you're a parasite, you can synchronize uh, and expect your bat to return because the greatest tragedy for a parasite is to lose your, your host because that's your home and your dinner. And so of course, if you're abandoned and your bat never comes back, you starve to death and your, your whatever community there, your community of parasites vanishes. Whereas if your bats are coming back every night or every few months, then you've got a chance to feed and move around the ecosystem. So the fact that there's a high roost fidelity in many bat species is quite an important factor for parasite diversity. Another factor is high dispersal ability. So bats can move over, over very broad areas, which means that you can transport parasites with them across very broad areas. So for instance, if one uh, bat species or one, one area is wiped out by a bushfire or a flood or a hurricane and all the suitable nesting habitat is gone, potentially your bats can disperse to quite sort of broad areas far away from this event to protect themselves. And also if they're already moving quite far away uh, or able to move quite far away to start with, you have these kind of insurance populations. So you can have reasonably widespread species in some cases, um, which in some other mammal, small mammal species, some small mammals and some marsupials, they're very small, that don't disperse as well. Typically that can lead to declines in extinctions. So it's, it's good for bats and it's good for their parasites that they can disperse quite far. And when I say like quite far, I mean reasonably far. So for instance, the gray headed flying fox which is a species we find around uh, my hometown of Melbourne, um, can disperse up to 50 kilometers in a single night's feeding. So it's quite, a, quite an extensive uh, ability to sort of move around the ecosystem, move around the landscape. And so here's an example of some bats uh, flying above Melbourne city uh, as the sun's setting. And there's great clouds of them moving through the landscape. Uh, sheltered roosts is also a very, very important thing for bats. Uh, bats and their parasites are incredibly vulnerable to things like desiccation. They don't wanna be drying out and they're also very vulnerable to predation. As you can see, this is an unfortunate uh, bat fly, probably of the genus uh, Cyclopodia. And it looks like it's probably fallen off what I would guess is a flying fox and it's landed uh, far away. And unfortunately, a group of green tree ants has discovered it and now they're dismembering it. So bats and their parasites wanna be very far away from predators and they wanna be in relatively uh, sort of thermally stable environments. They want somewhere nice, dark, cool, not too cold, not too hot kind of thing. And so the fact that they have these very, they tend to pick very, very sheltered and protected environments means that these populations of bat parasites can build up to remarkable numbers because they have very low, in some cases, predator pressure. Um, finally, uh, bats are endothermic. 
So it means that they are, I mean, endothermic is sort of another word that we sometimes use for warm blooded. So endothermic, it means they control their body temperature. And so because bats can control their body temperature, their parasites have something of an advantage over uh, other parasites, which may have chosen to live on so-called poikilothermic or cold blooded animals, which don't uh, regulate their own body temperature. So bat parasites are, are all invertebrates and so they can't control their body temperature. So they're reliant on some other factor for maintaining their body temperature and therefore uh, keeping their metabolism nice and high uh, in, in some cases. So if you're on a reptile, reptiles can uh, go out into the sun during the day and they can warm up a little bit and they can get quite warm. They can get warmer than mammals in some cases. But then of course at night they go and shelter somewhere and they're their body temperature drops down to the ambient temperature. Whereas bats have a very stable body temperature, often in the high 30s to low 40s. So if you have a look at this graph here, this is essentially a development day rate, just a, a general insect development day rate. And so you can see as the temperature goes up, it reaches this sweet spot, somewhere between sort of 35 and maybe 42 degrees Celsius, at which point uh, insects can develop very rapidly. Um, and so if you want to have many offspring and you want to have lots of generations and lots of descendants, having a high metabolism so that you can produce lots of young quickly is a very good move. And also because you're using this bat, you're not dependent on the outside environment. Um, you don't have to say slow down necessarily during the winter time when the temperature is cold and the reptile parasites have to slow their development somewhat because the reptiles go into hibernation or brumination. So let's have a look at some of the bat parasites. So certainly there are lots of different, uh, at least bat ectoparasites, which have evolved within the uh, family tree of insects. This is just the insects. So we're ignoring all the other arthropods of which there are many. Uh, this is just the insects. And we can see that broadly for bats, at least three different major groups of insects have independently evolved to parasitize bats. So in the top, we have uh, the order Hemiptera, which are the true bugs. So these are relatives of aphids and cicadas. And up there we have from left to right, we have kissing bugs. The next one along is Apolloctenid. This is a, a very, very rare bug family, which is only found on bats. There's somewhere between 20 to 30 species um, and they're very, very incredibly rare. During the, the broad period that I've been working on bat parasites, I've seen maybe five individuals of them. And this is from having looked at the parasites of literally thousands and thousands of bats. They're incredibly rare. The final one are the bat bugs. And these are relatives of our bed bugs. The next one down we have is the order Siphonaptera. So these are the fleas, which we will probably know uh, and loathe from uh, the individuals which jump around on our dogs or cats. Um, but of course, one at least one family of fleas has evolved specifically on bats, and uh, they can only be found on bats now. The final group are the diptera. So these are the true flies. So these are things like fruit flies and blow flies and bot flies. Um, and a number of uh, groups of flies have evolved to become highly specialized uh, ectoparasites of bats. So let's meet some of them. So this first individual, these first two individuals on the top left are the bat flies. And the next one along, we have a polyctenid, we have a bat bug, we have a kissing bug, we have this wonderful bat flea. And then the bottom three are arachnids. So these are obviously the arachnids are the groups that in, the, the group that incorporates spiders and scorpions, mites, harvestmen, pseudoscorpions, uropygids tailless whip scorpions. So it's, it's quite a diverse group, very, very species rich, particularly for the spiders. Probably something that blows the spiders out of the water though, as far as diversity though, are the mites. The mites are mega, mega diverse. Um, we know very little about the mites and the majority of Earth's mites have not been named yet. Um, and even we're finding many, many, many new mites and ticks on bat species still after many, many, many decades of work. So starting from the left to the right, um, this very hairy uh, four-legged mite is a bat wing mite. And this only lives on the membrane 
of the wings of bats. It can be found nowhere else. And this whole family is only found there. The next one along uh, this round uh, creature is a soft tick. And it has this sort of uh, round body and on the underside is its mouth parts uh, where it feeds from. And the final uh, individual we have is a hard tick. And so this long legged uh, member of the genus Izodes is a specialist of uh, generally microbats. So let's have a look at some of these families and, and I'll try and convince you of why I think they're certainly some of the most interesting organisms on earth and certainly uh, some of the most interesting parasites on earth. So the first is this absolutely bizarre family called the Nycteribiidae. The Nycteribiidae are sometimes called bat flies. And on the left, you can see a close relative of this family, which is the tsetse fly, the absolute scourge of Africa. And this is probably somewhat like what like the ancestor of the bat flies would have been like, this free flying uh, hematophagia, so blood feeding uh, parasitic fly. Within Africa, the tsetse flies will uh, fly around, uh, they'll feed on people and they'll uh, cause sleeping sickness in humans as they spread a, a small parasite called a trypanosome. Um, within cattle, they cause a disease called nagana, which is a, a very similar, also a trypanosomal disease of livestock. And uh, this is probably what the ancestor of these bat flies would have looked like. But of course, if you're hanging around on bats, it doesn't necessarily uh, pay to fly around because the bats all roost very tightly together. So you don't necessarily always need wings uh, to be moving between hosts. And so in the case of the Nycteribids, they've actually completely lost their wings. They, they never grow wings. Uh, the wings are completely absent. And so they've evolved into this much more strong, very robust-legged sort of spider-like uh, parasites, which scurry through the fur of the bats. Um, so they've basically gone from flies to walks. Of course, not all of them have gone from flies to walks. There's a sister family, um, called the Streblidae, and these are the flying bat flies. And they have retained their wings. They're not very powerful flyers, but they can sort of engage in brief periods of flight between uh, host species. So although wings seem to have been selected against through the evolution of, of flies on as ectoparasites, some of them still retain their wings. Whether it's a trait that's going to say vanish in 50 million years or not remains to be seen. Um, but clearly there's still some utility for it. Of course, this group is very unique because it also has another uh, special uh, group within it, the Ascodipteran, which is a special genus within this uh, winged bat fly family. And the females in this case have lost their legs and they've lost their wings. So you can see it in the photo on the right-hand side here. This blob, this maggot-like organism is actually the adult female of this genus. And she's completely lost her wings and legs in favor of becoming a subdermal parasite of bats, which is absolutely fascinating. So these, this, this one family has evolved all sorts of different traits to live on bats. Some have decided we'll keep our, I mean, evolution has decided for them, we'll keep our wings. Others have got to a point where wings are very cumbersome. And of course, growing them is, is very expensive. You have to expend resources, which you could grow, use to grow other things. So that's very difficult. And uh, wings can get damaged, wings can get caught on things. So for them, it's certainly not advantageous. They've decided, no, 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 we'll get rid of the wings, no wings for us. And there's of course this final group uh, within these bat flies where they've gone perhaps overboard and the females have basically said, no, we're not gonna grow wings or legs. We'll basically just be little egg machines and or, or little sort of egg reproductive machines and will just be these sort of blobs. And so in this case, the females are these blobs that live under the skin and the males are still grow wings and they move between bats. They fly between bats, finding these little sort of Jabba the Hutt blob females to uh, reproduce with. Another fascinating aspect of the bat flies is that I would consider them some of the, the greatest mothers of the living world. I think of the natural world. So on the left-hand side, you can see the typical life cycle of a fly. And on the right-hand side, you can see the typical life cycle of a bat fly. On the left, the very typical uh, life cycle of 
a fly is that a, a fly will mate and then it'll produce, in many cases, thousands of eggs. And so if it's a blowfly, it'll lay them on some carrion or some animal dung. Uh, fruit flies will lay them in, in fruit, often fallen fruit. The larvae will then typically go through three larval stages. Um, and then they'll finally form a, a cocoon, a pupa, before an adult emerges. Of course, if you're doing this though, you're a very vulnerable individual because anything could come along. You're a, you're a grub. In many cases, uh, they don't have very good uh, visual capabilities. So all sorts of things come along and eat you. And so because of that, female, your typical female fly is like, I'll make thousands of young. And if two of them survive or one of them survive, I'm happy because I've reproduced myself kind of thing. Because the expectation is that most of the eggs, offspring or pupae, if they make it that far, will be killed. They'll be predated on or they'll be parasitized uh, by some other organism, often uh, parasitic wasps and smaller parasitic flies. So they go for, uh, let's produce lots and hope that something gets through. The bat flies, on the other hand, have gone in completely the opposite direction. The female will only have one offspring at a time, which is very, very rare in invertebrates. Essentially, she will produce an egg, the egg will hatch, and she'll keep it inside her in a pouch, and she'll feed it on a special insect milk. So in many cases, they're a little bit like the marsupials of the insect world, these little pouches inside them, and these, uh, th this milk which they feed their offspring. And this is a process uh, technically called or defined as adenotrophic vivipary, which is a great boggle word if you're ever struggling in that game. I don't know if it's a valid word, but there you go. Essentially what happens is they feed these uh, offspring within them, the maggot, a single maggot at a time. The female's abdomen swells up to gigantic proportions as this offspring grows. And then when the offspring is ready to form a pupa, a cocoon, the female uh, ejects the young maggot and the agate, uh, maggot immediately congeals itself to the wall of the roost uh, site and forms this hardened cocoon. After a few weeks, the bat fly then emerges and crawls onto the nearest bat host. So in this case, they've decided, no, 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 we're not gonna let, we're not gonna sacrifice any of our young. We're gonna do a very, very good job of raising these young very successfully. And so that's what they do. Interestingly enough though, uh, bat flies are also hosts themselves. So the bats host the bat flies and then the bat flies host these bizarre organisms. These are small parasitic fungi. The fungi that we know and love and eat in many cases um, produce these great uh, networks of hyphae. These are pale root-like structures which uh, will often uh, grow through rotting wood, leaf litter, they'll grow through the soil. And then the part of the fungi we actually see is the mushroom. This fungi, on the other hand, does not grow this extensive uh, network of hyphae, this mycelium. Instead, the entire body of this fungus is this strange elongated structure which grows on the cuticle. So it grows on essentially the skin, the outer shell, the armor of the bat fly. So our bats are supporting this great diversity of very interesting bat flies. And then our bat flies are supporting this fantastic diversity of these interesting fungi. So there's all these kind of layers to these, these parasitic interactions, which is absolutely fascinating. Interestingly enough though, although the Streblidae, the winged bat flies, and the Nycteribidae, the wingless bat flies, seem to share a common ancestor that is, that they also share with the tsetse fly, but it's, it's some sort of tsetse fly-like uh, uh, blood feeding, but free flying uh, parasite. There is another group of flies which evolved completely on their own to converge on this form of a bat fly. So clearly life on bats as an ectoparasitic diptera, an ectoparasitic fly is a very useful one because it's evolved independently uh, more than once. So this special uh, little family of uh, bat flies has only a single member and it probably arose when New Zealand, uh, 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 when bats arrived in New Zealand. So the bats that arrived there had probably no parasites or, or no, no bat fly parasites on them. So this little native New Zealand uh, fly, its ancestors seem to have 
evolved on the bats and they've gradually evolved this form, which is very, very similar um, to the other bat flies. So they've lost their wings completely. They develop these very strong, robust legs and uh, they essentially feed on the, the blood of the bats there. Um, and it's probably because New Zealand is, is very isolated and hasn't necessarily been connected with much of the world uh, for a very, very long time. So this is the species that it's found on. It's on the New Zealand lesser short-tailed bat, which is uh, presently categorized as threatened. So it's, it's listed as vulnerable by the IUCN. So unfortunately, if we lose this precious little bat, which is one of only two remaining native mammal species on all of New Zealand. New Zealand is basically a country of birds and a few sort of token reptiles. Um, but they do have these two bats. And, and if this particular species is lost, we'll lose our very, very evolutionarily peculiar uh, New Zealand bat fly. So that's something to potentially be aware of that when we're losing these species, we're not just losing the host species, we're losing all the parasites that are associated with it. And who knows what sort of interesting parasitic fungi are living on this uh, New Zealand bat fly. So very interesting stuff. The next thing I wanted to talk about is how the flea lost its jump. The fleas that we know, and as I said, loathe, are typically the fleas that we find on our pets, but occasionally jump onto us. So these are uh, 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 known for their ability to jump. They're always jumping off cats and dogs as the cats and dogs are grooming themselves and they're jumping onto us and biting us. Um, when you're a flea on a bat at the top of a high cave though, or in a, a, a big roosting chamber, jumping around isn't necessarily a very advantageous thing to do because it's very easy to lose your host and end up on the bottom of a cave. So the typical flea jump was actually uh, studied and first characterized by a great hero of mine, the late Dame Miriam Rothschild, who worked on fleas for a huge proportion of her life, decades and decades and decades. Um, and she was the first to work out how they actually did it. Fleas don't actually jump from their feet. They jump, in some sense, from their knees, from their joints. Fleas have a very special, very, very elastic protein called resilin, which is present at the base, it's, it's present in a few of the joints, but the, the greatest uh, concentration of it in most fleas is found in what's called the pleural arch. So this is this uh, structure just underneath the pleural plate, which is what the arrow in this slide is pointing to. And essentially you can see this image, uh, these images, this set of four images were taken from her original paper um, of when it was first published decades and decades ago. And so essentially the flea gets down onto this, uh, onto uh, somewhere flat or some, some sort of uh, base. And then it sort of curls itself up. And what it's doing there is it's pulling its legs together and it's, it's storing energy in this resilin, it's preparing. And then finally, when it releases it, all this energy from the resilin comes out and it springs this flea a great distance. And so if you're a flea on a cat or a dog, you're already on the ground moving yourself around the den isn't such a risky uh, proposition because chances are there are other pups or other kittens in this den. And so flicking yourself around, uh, you're not gonna land necessarily very far from your host. And chances are you'll be able to find another host, which is what every parasite wants is to have a nice warm blood meal or what every flea wants anyway. However, if you're living in a cave and you drop 15 meters to the bottom of the cave, you may never find a bat again and you may starve. And so it seems that through evolutionary history, the ability to jump in bat fleas has been completely lost. They basically lack these pleural arches, this uh, structure filled with resilin, which is needed to jump. So the bat flea has lost its jump probably to avoid losing its beloved host. Interestingly enough though, of course, bat fleas do still sometimes like many ectoparasites become separated from their meal ticket. So recently this was um, a fascinating behavior was observed in Southeast Asia in my region. And it was that when the bat fleas sometimes end up on the bottom of the cave, they'll actually wait for a passing cave earwig and they'll lock themselves on to the leg and they'll basically use the earwig as a taxi service. Earwigs are constantly moving around the cave, uh, in many cases eating bat droppings, um, but all sorts of other things, they're scavenging. And so as they're moving around, they're potentially climbing up 
And so when the flea uh, hops on, it rides around this earwig cave taxi until it gets close enough to a bat, at which point it clambers off and walks along until it returns and is reunited to a bat host. So they have all sorts of interesting ways of getting around. Finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about another potential enemy of ours, the bed bug and where it came from. So when humans uh, first sort of left Africa, as we uh, immigrated into the rest of the world and spread our species across the land, uh, we encountered quite cold latitudes. So trying to move into say, Northeast Asia or Europe or North America, it's a very difficult endeavor because it's very snowy and cold for half of the year. And so humans started to inhabit these caves as they moved into northern latitudes. Um, and as we did that, we started to come into contact with two very important uh, parasites which have been with us ever since. These are the tropical bed bug, Chimax hemipterus, and the temperate bed bug, Chimax lectiolaris. Most of us are a lot more common with temperate cave bug, uh, the, the temperate bed bug, Chimax lectiolaris. Um, although people that live in the tropics, certainly in Singapore here, we have predominantly Chimax hemipterus. And originally the hypothesis was that these two apparently closely related bed bugs of the same genus, the suggestion was that potentially uh, one of them had evolved with our relative Homo erectus, one of the earlier Homo uh, member of our member of our genus that had left Africa before we did, and spread out all across the Eurasian continent and, and even into Southeast Asia to some extent, and that as they first got into caves, one lineage of bat bugs had specialized to live on them potentially, and that the second invasion, as humans displaced Homo erectus, we inherited their their bat bug. And we also got our own as a new lineage, a fresh lineage uh, evolved onto us. However, a recent study which uh, dated the divergence between these two species found that actually these species are more that have more than uh, 30 million years of divergence between them. So they last shared a common ancestor more than 30 million years ago, which really debunks that whole hypothesis because Homo erectus and Homo and humans certainly weren't around 30 million years ago. So they did their study and they actually found that probably these two bugs um, have independently colonized humans and have independently evolved, not on us, but potentially they've suggested Chimax hemipterus may have evolved on birds potentially dwelling in caves, although it's Chimax hemipterus is also found on bats and the Chimax lectiolaris has also diverged um, on bats before we've inherited them. Interestingly enough, though, despite the fact that the majority of members of this group, these so-called bat bugs, do live on bats, they actually predate bats by a very long time. So dating of this group suggests that the so-called bat bugs probably evolved during the late Cretaceous era. So this is when dinosaurs were still roaming the earth a little bit over 100 million years ago. And so they evolved during the uh, Cretaceous period on who knows what, potentially dinosaurs. They, they certainly feed on birds. Um, so that's an option, maybe on mammals, um, and then eventually clearly all their ancestors that were on these sort of other things in many cases have disappeared. And so now the modern uh, bat bugs are mostly living on predominantly bats, but also on birds and on some terrestrial uh, mammals. Um, so bat bugs or, or our bed bugs we've inherited from bats living in caves and they've inherited them from who knows what because they predate bats by quite a long time. The, the oldest bats are probably evolving somewhere around 70 million years ago, and then they appear in the fossil record about 50 million years ago. But these, these chaps here are predating them by at least 30 million years, probably a bit more. Interestingly enough, there does seem to be some uh, difference in distribution between the two species of bat bugs which have evolved to exploit us humans. Um, and as the name, the common name suggests, uh, the temperate and the tropical bed bugs seem to have been partitioned or partitioned themselves um, along latitude, some kind of latitudinal gradient. So the green dots here 
are where we find uh, many of the tropical bed bugs. And then the red dots or the red regions are where we find predominantly temperate bed bugs. Interestingly enough, the laboratory studies suggest that these species have quite a lot of thermal tolerance. So the temperate bed bug can survive in the, uh, the, in the tropical zone and the tropical bed bug can survive in the temperate zone. So the question then is, how are these bed bugs, uh, how are these bed bugs partitioned in this way and what's keeping those barriers from breaking down? To some extent, the barriers seem to be breaking down. So now we find that certainly in most metropolises, we find the temperate bed bug, Chymex lectularis, seems to be invading many of these environments. Um, and we're also finding some cases of Chymex hemipterus invading some of the temperate zones as well. So the tropical bed bug is getting into the temperate zones and the temperate bed bug seems to be moving into the tropical zones. So how do they sort of, have they been partitioning for so long? And the answer uh, is probably very violent sex, which is quite a peculiar way to partition yourself. Um, so bed bugs are the insect masters of BDSM. They engage in all sorts of nasty, traumatic uh, things, particularly traumatic insemination. And in this case, the male bed bug, when he finds a female, will not actually wait to, to go into her genital opening. He'll just stab her. So he'll stab her with his, uh, his, his phallus, his penis, and he'll just inject uh, sperm directly into her. Um, within their species, this typically is not a problem. So the female's uh, body will then gather up the sperm and store it in spermatheci um, and then use it to produce eggs later. However, when different species of bed bugs artificially inseminate one another, uh, typically the female will die. So in many cases, it's so, so in this case, it is quite possible that when Chymex lectularis, the temperate bed bugs, makes it into the tropical zone and tries to mate with the local females there, that they all just die. And so this barrier is keeping these species from moving in too much, um, which is quite a possibility. But of course, it's something that we need more study on, but it's quite fascinating, I think. Finally, let's consider what the future of bats and their parasites are, because we live in a period of immense global change. So these are two interesting maps or, or graphs, which I think are useful for illustrating a point. The first is on the left here, and this is basically an idea of that they surveyed a, a range of different bat biologists and they said, what in your opinion as a professional bat biologist, do you think are the greatest drivers of bat decline globally? And so you can see them stacked there. So the majority of bat, just over the majority of bat biologists uh, believe that deforestation um, was probably the most significant uh, driver. Many also said that climate change, intensive agriculture, urbanization, infectious diseases like white nose syndrome, which is caused by a parasitic fungus, which kills hibernating bats in, in North America, that's, that's a real risk. And then finally hunting, because in some regions, places like uh, India, they still do bat hunts. In Papua New Guinea, they still do some, some bat uh, harvesting. And basically places where people are eating bats, that's also quite a risk uh, to global bat populations. The second graph is depicting where we have the highest versus the lowest bat richness. So if you're in Northern Siberia, there are basically no bats. There's almost no bat diversity. As we get closer to the tropics though, the equatorial zone, we find that the bat diversity goes up significantly. And among the tropical regions, Southeast Asia, Central Africa, but of course, uh, Northern South America, tropical South America, Brazil, Venezuela, uh, these areas have hyper bat diversity, massive, massive bat diversity. So we have a whole bunch of these factors which are affecting bats. Bats tend to be concentrated in the tropics. Unfortunately, the tropics is also a zone where we have immense poverty compared with what we might call the global north. Um, so the developed nations. In, in uh, tropical regions, nations are uh, disproportionately developing still. So that doesn't bear well because many of these factors we have are associated with development. So things like deforestation, um, things like urbanization, things like hunting are often associated with uh, lower socioeconomic economies. 
But where do bats compare in terms of their conservation? Because of course, if we understand the conservation of bats, we can have some understanding of the conservation of their parasites. So if we have a look at this graph on the far left-hand side, we can see that um, quite a number of bats are, are threatened. So we can see there, there are plenty, there are some that are critically endangered, some that are vulnerable, some that are near threatened, which is a decent chunk of them. Uh, the majority of bats are listed as least concerned. But interestingly enough, compared with, say, other mammals or birds, there's a lot of data deficient bats. So these are species for which we have such little ecological or population trend data, that we actually can't do any kind of estimation of what's happening to their populations. So potentially these are species which may be vanishing from our forests and our, um, our world uh, without us even knowing, because potentially they're in difficult to survey places or maybe they're rare species, um, or maybe they're difficult to sample. Finally, the, the two graphs on, or the two maps on the right-hand side are the proportion of threatened species and the proportion of data deficient species. <clears throat> so we can see the majority of threatened species are actually in my region of Southeast Asia. And so in places like the sort of Indo-Chinese, the continental Southeast Asia, places like Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar, um, and also in the West Pacific, so you can see there's uh, some, it's lighting up in places like the Solomon Islands and Fiji, where there's uh, quite a number of threatened bat species. You can also see some in Africa, and there's a good chunk in uh, South America. What's more worrying though, is when you have a look at the second map down the bottom, this data deficient species, we find that the species that are especially data deficient are in the global south. So these are species in developing, predominantly developing countries, and the real hotspot for it is in tropical South America. So this is the place with our highest richness of bats, also has our highest number, unsurprisingly, of data deficient bats. So this is an indication that we need to get out there, we need to sample bats, we need to sample their parasites, we need to understand what the population trends are looking like, if we're gonna have any hope of protecting them. So really, any bat researchers, anybody interested in bats needs to start looking to the tropics if they're not already, if they want to do some really meaningful bat conservation, or likewise, parasitologists, if they want to be doing some meaningful bat parasite conservation, we need to really seriously be looking at the tropics, because that's where the majority of our data deficient or threatened bats are. That's where the majority of our bats in general are. Um, and that's where a lot of our species are going to be going extinct, especially as many of these countries uh, move from developing countries to developed countries over the next 50 to say 100 years. <clears throat> so finally, I'd like to uh, make some acknowledgements. So first, uh, I just wanted to acknowledge some of the uh, institutions and individuals uh, that allowed me to use uh, their images of some bat parasites. And then, of course, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, the organizer who actually invited me here to talk your ear off about bat parasites uh, Li Chenhua, who uh, has organized the parasite section of this conference uh, uh, with great skill. And that is the end of the presentation. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you very much for listening and, and, and uh, considering bats and their parasites as something uh, worthy of your attention. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Kwok, for the amazing presentation, and thank you for joining us here. Thanks for having me. So we will now take questions. The very first question we have is from Sandra Avila, asked, after mating and with the ovo still in the female, they make the pupa? So this question is in reference of the parasitic flies that are oval VV sure. Okay, so this is the hippoboscoidea. So these are the the, uh, the bat flies, right? So essentially, uh, it doesn't form a pupa while it's in the female. The the female will nourish the young adenotrophic vivipary, is what it's called, um, and then she will oviposit the larva. So the ovi the, the larva will spend a very very brief few minutes 
as an immature, free-living individual. And basically it spends this whole time uh, sitting there trying not to get eaten or groomed or anything like that off the host. And then the pupil will start to form um, around the, the, the larva itself. And then it will sort of form this pupil, which will glue onto the, the side of the roost, the cave, the hollow, whatever it's in. Um, and then it'll develop within that pupa. Yeah. Thank you. And our next question is from Diane Barton. How does the actual parasite diversity, species richness, and intensity of infection of microbiotes, fruit bats, compare to microbiotes? Hmm. Odd question. <laughs> so the truth is, it's not, I would say, not well studied enough to be able to make the comparison. Exactly. So obviously, we know that the microbats are far more species rich than the megabats, that the microchiroptera is very, very rich. The megachiroptera is, is reasonably species poor, I would say. Um, and it's typically more of an equatorial group, whereas the microbats are, are found across the across the board from very, very high temperate latitudes through to the tropics. If we were just going on a species, uh, like a, a, a total diversity uh, aspect, of course the microbats win out because they just have more species. So of course you have many more ectoparasites on them. In terms of a, a say species for species kind of uh, approach of what's the mean number of parasites on a megabat versus the mean number of parasites, say species diversity, on a microbat, it probably comes out relatively similar. Um, even in species that aren't roosting in, uh, what would you say, sheltered environments like caves or hollows, so the, like the large fruit bats, uh, they still manage to have a, a reasonably high diversity of even things like bat flies. So the, the bat flies in those cases will be laying their pupae, um, sometimes on the underside of branches under bark, uh, things like that. So they still manage to have reasonably similar uh, parasite diversity on them. And when we look at them, a lot of the species which are sort of bat specialists tend to undertake this adenotrophic vivipary. So this like massive investment in, uh, in single offspring at a time. So not only the bat flies do it, but the spintonicid wing mites, which spend their entire existence on the wings of bats uh, also have convergently evolved towards a single, uh, this, this, this same reproductive system of producing one offspring at a time, putting a huge amount of energy into it. Um, so I would say to, to run a complicated, say, good quantitative analysis looking at, say, mean diversity per species, comparing microbats to macrobats, I don't necessarily think we have enough available data. Uh, I mean, we could run it, but there's probably a lot of species that are undescribed, especially among the mites on bats. Um, certainly for abundance, man, your, your guess is as good as mine. It's uh, the data is certainly not there to be able to do some kind of big meta-analysis of it. But I would say on average, they probably have reasonably similar diversity. You might see slightly higher diversity on the micro bats simply because they roost in more protected environments. So it gives you chances to have extra groups of ectoparasites, which basically don't occur on megabats. Things like the Ichnocylidae, which are the bat fleas. They basically, the larvae need, they eat uh, blood flecks from the adults and they'll sometimes eat detritus. So they need somewhere uh, stable and safe to grow up. And obviously if you're a, a fruit bat colony living in a fig tree, uh, the chances of that flea getting back up to find a fruit bat is very, very low. So that, that family of fleas is basically non-existent almost on any of the megachiroptera, almost. Um, so probably the microchiroptera win out by a hair sort of thing. That would be my general sense for it. Still very diverse. Thank you. Our next question is from Mickey. Considering the large size of the actual parasites and the diversity, is there evidence of interspecific competition modulating parasite species richness? Yeah, good, very good question. And the answer is for most species, we have absolutely no idea. Um, certainly uh, uh, associates of mine who collect, so say bat carers, 
that um, I'm close with who collect specimens for me say that they do tend to find some partitioning on the host. And we find evidence certainly in other ectoparasite groups and other host groups for uh, some sort of sort of niche partitioning or like uh, partitioning of feeding habitats. So we know, for instance, ticks on birds uh, in, in, in some groups anyway, the ticks will disproportionately aim for the head because it's very, very hard to groom the head. So clearly evolution has favored this sort of strategy because all the individuals that stuck around in other parts of the body of the birds got groomed off. So some species of bird ticks will specifically aim uh, for the head. We certainly know that in things like sea snake ticks, Amblyomanitidum, uh, they typically go for damage around the body. So they'll uh, go for, if, if a, a snake has had scarring or something during a shed or, or from predation or something, they'll often try and uh, find these tight little crevices or they'll go around the cloaca um, or the ear, the ear openings and things like that. Um, so in bats, there is certainly observational, like personal observations of this happening. I wouldn't say that within, say, the literature on bats that there's it's been particularly well studied. And even in some other more well studied groups, like say birds or reptiles, there's not a huge amount of data on it yet. It's certainly coming and it's coming sort of hot and fast um, for some of these groups. But for bats, it hasn't been very well studied yet, but it probably is um, uh, occurring to some extent. Certainly for some uh, groups on bats, we know that there definitely is uh, partitioning of space uh, that, that some groups will favor very particular zones. So we know, say, the spintonicid mites, the, the bat wing mites, spend their entire life on the bat wing membrane. You never find them almost ever on the fur of the bat, they're almost always on the wing membrane. So there's clearly some levels of partitioning going on for this entire family of mites has decided amongst itself. They've got together and they've said, the wings are really good. You're not gonna get groomed off there very easily. And there's lots of available blood vessels to feed on. Drink up boys. Um, but for some other groups like bat flies, it, it's less clear. And the fact that when we collect them, so when you're handling bats, man, they go everywhere. Like they're scurrowing through first. So trying to work out where they most like to occur is a really, really tough, tough question. For things that are more sedentary when they feed, like ticks, um, it's a lot easier. But for these actively moving things like bat fleas and bat flies, uh, good luck to whatever grad student wants to try and work that out. It's kind of a thankless job and it'll be very, very hard, but there probably is some level of partitioning going on, I would guess. Thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, this is the end of this session. Thank you again for Dr. Mackenzie Quack for the great presentation and answering our questions. Thank, thank you, you everyone, everyone for joining, joining and, and thanks, thanks for having me. Thank you. And our next session, we will have parasite and host animals with pouches from Dr. Michelle Power and Dr. Stephanie Godfrey. And it will start at 8 p.m. Mountain Time, which is in two minutes. So let's take a two minutes break and see you in the next session. G'day everyone, I'm Michelle Power, a parasitologist from Sydney, Australia. I'm coming to you from a park that's not very far from the city centre. It's about two kilometres from the Sydney Harbour. Today, myself and a number of colleagues, uh, other parasitologists and students, will tell you about our favourite marsupial and also their parasites. And just to let you know that we are still in lockdown, so
Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming back or staying. Or uh, if you're just joining us, hello. This is our third session of the day two of the Parasite Biodiversity Day event organized by the Global Parasitologist Coalition. We're happy to present Parasites and Host Animals with Pouches with Dr. Michelle Power from Macquarie University in Australia and Dr. Stephanie Godfrey from the University of Otka in New Zealand. Dr. Power also invited some guests talking about their favorite marsupials parasites in the presentation. So her guests are Tana Suki from University of Melbourne, and she heard from the University of Sydney, Scott Carver from University of Tasmania, Sarah Pre uh, Preston from the Charles Stute University, James Samis at Macquarie University, Nina Cattle and Ruth Bai, who both study at Macquarie University. So, what do kangaroos carry as they hop around? What else are we saving when saving Tasmania devils? Let's follow our presenter, presenters to discover the fascinating world of marsupial parasite. And as a reminder, we will have a short Q&A session in the end. So we encourage you to submit or post your questions through the YouTube chat along the way. Thank you. G'day everyone, I'm Michelle Power, a parasitologist from Sydney, Australia. I'm coming to you from a park that's not very far from the city centre. It's about two kilometres from the Sydney Harbour. Today, myself and a number of colleagues, uh, other parasitologists and students will tell you about our favourite marsupial and also their parasites. And just to let you know that we are still in lockdown, so we'll be zooming in from our homes and various sorts of places, or some others might have been able to get out into a park like I have. While I am out in a park, uh, we won't see any marsupials. There's a few marsupials that have made cities their homes and can be found dwelling in our rooftops of houses, but marsupials are nocturnal. So the best time to see them and hear them is during the early early morning hours or the late evening hours, so at dawn and dusk, or during the night when you're spotlighting. But what we can do is we can find remnants of marsupials and, and we can go and look on the ground behind us and we'll be able to um, locate and collect and find exactly what a parasitologist needs to do their work on parasites. So we're here to talk about parasites in animals with pouches or marsupials. So there's about 330 marsupial species around the world. So they occur in South America. There's one species in North America, but most species are found here in Australia. And we have around 220 marsupial species. So the ones you'll be familiar with will be the koala and the kangaroo. But we also have uh, other species that have adapt adapted to different environments in Australia. So for example, tree dwellers. So an um, we have the sugar glider here that you can see on the slide. Sugar gliders have a membrane that uh, runs a bit from their forelimb to their hindlimbs and allows them to glide between trees. So it's not flying, but they can glide. They're not like wings, okay? We have carnivorous marsupials and pictured in the slide are quolls and Tasmanian devils and you'll hear more about Tasmanian devil parasites uh, a bit later on. And also antichinus, which is a little insectivorous marsupial that looks very much like a mouse. So I mentioned that you have uh, in North Canada, uh, sorry, North America, uh, a marsupial species called an opossum pictured here so it's a carnivore as well and so you can see here that the opossum is carrying its babies on its back instead of in a pouch now some marsupial species do this after a certain age the babies get too big to be carried in the pouch and so they're carried around on the back another example is the koala pictured here and also Tasmanian devils will carry their offspring that way as well and of course though kangaroos which you see here um, uh, carried around in the pouch for quite a long time and you'll often see very big kangaroos that can 
baby kangaroos still, but you know, maybe like teenage kangaroos, still trying to get their head back in the pouch and climb in, but they're too big to get in there. And that's a behavior that we see often when we're out working with kangaroos in the field. So the parasites that we find in animals with pouches or marsupials are the same taxonomic group as parasites that we find in some of the animals that you would have heard about in the other sessions of this parasite festival. So ectoparasites, fleas and ticks, and endoparasites, worms. But we also, um, today we'll probably focus more on, well I will, on my favorite parasites, and they're the protozoa. So the three parasites that I work on or that I'm interested in, they're so small that you actually need a microscope to be able to view them. And so here they are pictured on the slide. So that's Cryptosporidium, Giardia and Imeria. But before I talk about my favourite parasites in uh, probably one of my favourite animals, the Tasmanian Devil, we're going to hear from a number of my colleagues talking about their favourite marsupials and also their favourite parasites that are found in or on marsupials. Hi, I'm Manushika Herat. I'm a postdoctoral researcher affiliated to University of Sydney and Macquarie University. My favourite marsupial is the common brush-tailed possum. Those who have seen a possum knows that they have the cutest pink nose that you have ever seen. Brush-tailed possums are native to Australia and distributed throughout the continent in both urban and natural landscapes. They are also found in New Zealand where they are considered as a pest. Brush-tailed possums host a lot of parasites. However, my focus today is the uh, protozoan genus Cryptosporidium. Cryptosporidium can cause enteric diseases in a range of host vertebrate hosts, including humans, and also can be fatal for immunocompromised individuals. Uh, there are nearly 38 species of Cryptosporidium species and 40 genotypes identified so far. Most of these Cryptosporidium species or gen uh, genotypes are host specific, that is they cause diseases in particular hosts. However, some cryptosporidium species uh, can cause diseases in multiple type of species as well. Uh, the cryptosporidium genotype found in brush-tailed possums is unique to them. Because of that, um, this host specificity, it is less likely for brush-tailed possums to spread cryptosporidium to other species. However, uh, cryptosporidium species or, or genotypes, there are two other genotypes found in brush-tailed possums, which is somewhat similar to Cryptosporidium hominis and Cryptosporidium parvum, which is a major cause of Cryptosporidiasis in humans. But all these three genotypes found in brush-tailed possums are genetically and morphologically different from any other identified species or genotype. Because of this reason, it is less likely for possums to spread diseases to other animals. Currently, we are looking at uh, and studying urban adapted brush-tailed possums to see whether they host Cryptosporidium parvum and Cryptosporidium hominis as a result of urban adapted possums using anthropogenic resources and uh, the likelihood of reverse zoonosis from humans to animals uh, through possums. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Tana Suki from Melbourne University, Australia. My favourite parasite in marsupial? It was a tricky question because there are so many. But the one that's closest to my heart is Macropostrongoloides bailasi. It's a species of roundworm which the adult stage lives inside the large intestines of kangaroos and wallabies. And kangaroos and wallabies are normally just full of worms. It's like they're hopping around carrying entire ecosystems of worms in their stomach. Most of them don't cause any harm in healthy, free-ranging kangaroos. So technically, in my opinion, they're not bad parasites. Um, out of the several hundred species of roundworms that infect kangaroos, Macropostrongoloides bailasi is my favourite. I mean, from a distance, they're just small, 
plain pinkish white little worms that were thought to be a generalist species, meaning that they weren't picky about their hosts. We'd find them in eastern grey kangaroos, red kangaroos, wallaroos all over Australia. But when we looked at them closely, at the genetics and morphology, there were several different species which were mostly host specific. But the most fascinating thing about them was the detail of their morphology that hadn't been noticed before. Things like the patterns on their tail and the, the shape of their head. To me, Macropostrongoloides bailisii was a classic representation of the hidden diversity of parasites. Um, they may appear small and insignificant, but when you look closely, there's so many things to be discovered. And that's pretty awesome. Hello everyone, uh, my name is James Sams and I'm a medical sciences graduate from Macquarie University City. I'd like to start by acknowledging that this recording is taking place on the traditional land of the Bidjigal people of the Darug Nation and pay my respect to elders past, present and future. So what is my favourite marsupial? Um, I'd have to say it's the Numbat, also known as the Banded Anteater. Uh, native to Australia, this diurnal compact marsupial has a tongue that spans one third its body length, allowing it to burrow into crevices to obtain its mainly insectivorous termite diet. Um, with rapidly deteriorating habitats and parasitic vulnerabilities, there are estimated, unfortunately, to be fewer than a thousand Numbats nationally, classing them as an endangered marsupial species. One very interesting but obviously problematic parasite for numbats is Acanthocephalon, um, also known as spiny, spiny headed worms due to their reversible proboscis. Um, these parasitic worms shed very few eggs and are thus commonly difficult to diagnose until obstruction of the gut occurs in the host. Luckily, though, a broad spectrum of anti parasitic agents are able to treat spiny headed worms, and work is currently underway to treat captive numbats. Um, numbats are extremely cute, as you can see from the image above, um, but they also play an important role in the niche ecosystems they inhabit, in that they eat roughly 17,000 termites daily, greatly reducing the population of an overtly destructive insect species. And though I really appreciate looking at spiny-headed worms and their ability to turn their heads inside out, I'm happy to remove them in order to protect our Australian anteater. Uh, thank you for your time. G'day, my name is Dr. Sarah Preston and I live in Victoria in Australia. Thank you for asking me the question, what is your favourite marsupial parasite? Now, just for your future reference, you should never ask the parasitologist what their favourite parasite is. It's a question with too many answers. It's like asking a person what their favourite ice cream is. Is it caramel or is it honeycomb? Oh, hang on. Could be peppermint. The list goes on. Luckily, you have narrowed it down to a marsupial. The marsupial I've chosen to, spoke about, to speak about with you today is the wombat. Now, you can see a wombat behind me. This is Nalia. And if I move slightly, you might be able to see her joey, honey bun. Honey bun is quite rare because she was born as an albino joey. From the wombat. These photos are from our wombats from our local wildlife park and the credit would have to go to one of the students or a student of mine called Emily Flatters. Now luckily these wombats are in very good care um, so there would not be, um, well it would be very unlikely that they would have had a exposure to a parasite infection but if they were out in the wild then they could be exposed to some nasty parasites such as ticks and mites and some worms. One worm that the wombat in the wild is sometimes exposed to are worms that we call tapeworms. Now tapeworms are called tapeworms because they basically look like a tape or a piece of tape, like masking tape. They're very long and flat. Uh, I always think they look like the past fettuccine and I do like my fettuccine pasta. Members of this class of parasites are called endoparasites. That means they live inside the host or they live inside the wombat. They're also flat worms because when you take them out, they're very flat. They also lack a mouth and a gut. Now, tapeworms are very interesting because 
they have a, a head-like structure that we call a scolex, and they use this structure to latch onto the insides of their host. So in the wombat, they'd be living in the, the sort of the small intestine part, so just, just before their stomach. Um, and they've got this head-like structure called the scolex, but then after the scolex, they've got these long sort of segments, and these segments can grow and grow and grow. Uh, and they're very repetitive. And we also call these segments proglottids. And in these segments, they actually contain their reproductive organs. What's really interesting about tapeworms too, is they contain both male and female reproductive organs, which means they could be a male or a female. They can pick and choose. Some of these uh, tapeworms can be several meters long, uh, and they can contain thousands of these ploglottids or segments. The largest ever known tapeworm was actually found in a blue whale. So you can imagine how long that was. I think it was about 12 metres. There are some tapeworms that are quite small, so they only contain four or five segments or proglottids. So they can also be quite small. So most of the tapeworms that naturally infect wombats all marsupials don't cause much harm, but there is one nasty tapeworm that can be found in wombats sometimes. This is Echinococcus grandulosus. It's thought to be introduced to Australia when the European settlers came, so when they brought over the sheep and the domestic dog. And what's happened is that wombats actually accidentally ingest these eggs. They ingest them from the environment and these eggs will then turn into cysts, and these cysts sort of get lost in the wombat's organs, uh, and they form cysts and then eventually cause damage, mainly through pathology, uh, and they can end up dying with these cysts. For wombats, it's really common to see these um, in the lung area. However, in general, a wombat dying from um, these cysts or tapeworms that cause cysts is quite rare. Well, that's all from Australia, folks. I hope you guys can visit soon. Hi, everybody. My name is Scott Carver, and I'm a scientist at the University of Tasmania. I'm, I'm here to talk to you today about my absolute favourite Australian marsupial, which is called wombat. Uh, and wombats are the largest burrowing herbivores in the world. They are a kind of bear-shaped marsupial that uh, digs a burrow and lives in that underground and comes out usually to forage for about two to four hours a day on surrounding grass. There's three species of wombat in Australia, uh, and the one that I study is called the bear-nosed or also called the common wombat. Uh, and my favorite fact about wombats is that they produce these cube-shaped poos uh, and uh, that help at them aggregate in areas, and they use these as a form of chemical communication. Some colleagues and I won a Ig Nobel Prize a few years ago for discovering how they did that. So that's one of my fun facts. Um, but fun facts aside, I also want to talk about uh, sarcoptic mange disease, which is a major disease of wombats. And it was introduced to Australia by European settlers and their domestic animals. And it's mostly an animal welfare issue of wombats. They're highly susceptible to this and they develop crusted mange disease, which is driven by a type four hypersensitivity reaction. Uh, mange disease in wombats leads to uh, alopecia and hyperkeratosis and all of those other sort of typical symptoms associated with mange disease in many animals. Um, and they lose heat to the environment. They have elevated metabolic rates uh, and generally suffer a slow decline until they die from it. It can occasionally cause population effects, such as local population declines, but mostly it causes individual uh, deaths and uh, and it persists in their populations without sort of causing widespread local extinctions and those sorts of things. It can be treated and we are working on various treatments for that, but it's tricky to do and it's an area of our active research. So thank you all for listening to my talk. Hi, my name is Nina and I study medical sciences at Macquarie University. Today, I want to talk to you about my favorite marsupial, the quokka. 
The quagga is Australia's cutest marsupial found only in Western Australia, mainly on Rottnest and Bald Islands. But sadly, the world's happiest mammal is highly susceptible to parasitic diseases due to introduced species carrying them to the islands. Toxoplasmosis is a protozoan disease and is just one example. And feral cats have been have brought Toxoplasmosis gondii to Australia and spread it to the islands in Western Australia's waters. There is evidence to suggest that this parasite has the ability to change the behaviour of the quagga, making it more susceptible to predation. This means that feral cats could more easily hunt the quokka, completing the life cycle of toxoplasmosis and ensuring that it finds its way back to its definitive host, the cat. Quokka's populations are declining and the species have been labelled vulnerable by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. And while it doesn't appear that toxoplasmosis is a direct cause of this decline, it certainly could be cause for concern. Sadly, very little research has been done to determine whether this infection is a significant threat to quokkas. Studies are generally outdated, with only one study from 1966 really investigating the link. However, the data collected was merely an estimate, with poor sampling and control methods. A paper in 2016 looked at the limited available evidence and found that Toxoplasma gondii could be a major threat to quokka populations. More research needs to be done to prevent our quokka populations from becoming endangered or extinct. And this research really needs to incorporate better sampling and control measures in order to collect appropriate and reliable data. Unfortunately, providing treatment to our wild quokkas is an unlikely solution and prevention methods also difficult and expensive. And due to the limited research, it's hard to know to what extent we need to address toxoplasmosis in our quokka populations. In captive populations, however, enclosures are effective at preventing feral cats from accessing the animals, and some medications are also available and shown to be effective against the disease. I hope you've enjoyed hearing all about quokkas today. Help us protect these vulnerable critters. Hi, I'm Ruth. I'm a student at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia, studying a Bachelor of Medical Sciences. So my favourite marsupial is Sarcophilus harrisi or heresii, commonly known as the Tasmanian devil. I, got, I first got to know about it as a child through the cartoon Looney Tunes, where the Tasmanian devil named Taz was depicted as a vicious and ravenous beast. However, if you look at pictures of the Tasmanian devil, I think it's actually quite cute. It looks like a black baby bear. So the Tasmanian devil is the largest carnivorous marsupial in the world, found only on the island of Tasmania in Australia. They usually feed on small prey such as frogs, birds, fish, and insects. Tragically, the Tasmanian devil population plummeted because of a widespread illness called the devil facial tumor disease. The marsupial is currently listed as endangered by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. So one parasite of the Tasmanian devil is Toxoplasma gondii or T. gondii. It is a protozoan parasite that infects warm-blooded animals, including humans, and causes the disease toxoplasmosis. T. gondii has multiple hosts, so um, it has its definitive host where it can reproduce sexually, and these are cats or members of the feline family. The cat sheds T. gondii oocysts in its feces. Now, oocysts are egg-like structures that are highly resistant to damage, and the Tasmanian devil can get infected with T. gondii by ingesting these oocysts or any meat containing live parasites. The oocysts turn into an infectious form and localize in the muscle and neural tissues. We still don't know the full effects of a T. gondii infection and in Tasmanian devils, so hopefully further research is done and I can keep admiring these cute animals. Some great stories there about parasites in marsupials. And I'm going to follow on from Ruth and talk about other parasites in Tasmanian devils. So um, the Tasmanian devil is threatened by this transmissible cancer, Tasmanian devil or devil facial tumour disease. And basically in Australia, there's a national recovery plan to uh, recover numbers and protect 
the Tasmanian devil and stop them from going extinct. And really interestingly, as part of that plan, um, it also includes a defined goal to save the Tasmanian devil parasites. And the reason for this is that the Tasmanian devils have some very unique parasites that don't occur in other species. So if the Tasmanian devil goes extinct, so do some of these parasites. But before I go on, I'd just like to acknowledge Liana Waite here, who's also on uh, this slide. And Liana is a former student and a lot of the data that I'm presenting on Tasmanian devils was undertaken by her when she was studying with me and um, we're continuing to look at parasites in Tasmanian devils today. So coming back to this elusive parasite, it's called Daisy Uretina robusta. It's a form of tapeworm and as I said it's only found in Tasmanian devils. So if we lose the devil, we lose a parasite species. And Given this, the Daisy Uretinia robusta is listed as a threatened species. Um, oh, sorry, Tasmanian devil, T Daisy Uretinia robusta is listed on the Th Tasmania's threatened species list and identified as rare. And for all we know, the parasite may actually be extinct. We do know of other parasites that are present in Tasmanian devils and so there's 25 species of parasites that have been described and reported. So seven species of nematodes or roundworms, nine species of platyhelminths or tapeworms, uh, three species of protozoa and six species of ectoparasites, so um, ticks and lice um, as examples there. So Liana did some work looking at the distribution of or the occurrence of uh, the different parasites in Tasmanian devils throughout this captive breeding and, and recovery or what we would term the Tasmanian devil insurance population. When uh, captive in, in this insurance population, captive uh, devils are uh, bred and maintained under different conditions. So there's kind of intensive housing where you have a couple of devils together that might be a breeding pair or, or young offspring or juveniles through to the next stage up where we have big open plan cages um, but they're still enclosed and then finally into animals that are in the wild. And you can see here depicted on the slide that we have wild intensive captives. So that's those, those small cages with a few animals, or smaller, they're not small, but smaller cages with a few animals versus these free range large enclosures. But they're also in captivity there as well. So you can look at the graph and um, the different parasites are along the bottom. So we've got a roundworm here, Baileyaspirus, Tasmaniensis, uh, Woolleyi, Sarcophili, Anna Platinia daisyurii, another tapeworm, but it actually has a broad host range and is found in quolls, as well as Tasmanian devils. Then we get into the protozoa, some coccidia, which is a common term um, inclusive of the parasite that I mentioned earlier on in the introduction, Iberia, and then also Cryptosporidium here, um, and finally Giardia. So three protozoan parasites, my favourite parasites. And what these bars tell us that if we look at animals in the wild, so the red bars uh, and on the prevalence, we can see that 25% of animals sampled um, from the wild had this parasite, okay? Um, whereas if we come across this cryptosporidium, almost 50% of animals in the wild um, were carrying the cryptosporidium parasite. And so we can really just see here that, um, you know, devils have, Tasmanian devils have lots of diverse parasites or these particular groups of parasites and they're still present within the insurance population which is really important because parasites are an important part of the ecosystem and their host and if we're managing animals in captivity and removing their parasites then we're upsetting the balance of that relationship between parasites and their hosts and who knows perhaps we're possibly driving parasites to extinction. So it's interesting just to note while we're talking about parasites and this slide gives me the opportunity to say, you know, most of the time animals are infected with more than one parasite. So we don't have one species, we don't have one worm or one, one protozoa. I mean, humans tend to 
be like that in some areas but when we're talking about wildlife and in their natural conditions they're usually carrying more um, multiple parasite species and that's what this little graph here shows so we can see here that if you look at uh, basically the bars there's three colors uh, four colors um, white pink and um, like a ready ready dark red there and then black and this is suggesting whether they're within the, the animal sampled, whether they're carrying zero, one, two, or three parasites. And really, um, it's quite a detailed slide, but what I'd like to just to go away with is that, um, you know, if you look at the different sites we sampled or that the, basically the, the different areas um, where we sampled Tasmanian devils, the animals in those areas are carrying multiple parasites and as shown by these different colored bars. So what do Tasmanian devil parasites look like? So here's some great photos that Liana took and these parasite stages are eggs and what we would term oocysts for protozoa and you actually purify these out of Tasmanian devil poo. So we collect the poo, take it to the lab and then apply some techniques to remove the parasite stages. So you can see here a tapeworm egg uh, for Anaplatina daisy urii, and then a nematode or a roundworm egg here for Woolia uh, sarcophili, and then finally this unknown species of uh, coccidia or possibly an Imeriad. So my favorite parasites, the, the protozoa. But I'm going to cut, talk about two of these today a little bit deeply. Um, actually, none of these today on this slide. Um, but I'm going to talk about two further species a little bit more. And you've heard about one species called Cryptosporidium um, uh, from Anashika today. And so Cryptosporidium is a protozoan parasite that's found in a diverse range of animals, including marsupials. So marsupials in Australia have their own species, which um, you you can see on the slide, Cryptosporidium fayeri and Cryptosporidium macropodum. So these Cryptosporidium species are found in a wide array of marsupials and even have been identified in the odd case of humans. Okay. So we went out and were looking at Cryptosporidium again in Tasmania devils and looking to see if Cryptosporidium was more common in either the captive breeding uh, program, K, uh, populations, so those um, animals that are being intensively bred and managed or in those free-range enclosures versus what we saw in the wild. And what's really interesting is we see that animals in the wild have more um, cases or, or are more likely to have cryptosporidium. So 45% of animals, uh, Tasmanian devils in the wild, were de we, we, de we detected, sorry, let me try again. We detected cryptosporidium in 45% of animals that we sampled from the wild and then um, in less than 10% in those captive populations. So this is really good news for the animals in captivity. You know, they don't have parasites, but it's also really good news for the animals in the wild because, um, you know, often cryptosporidium uh, and particularly species that are host specific uh, don't cause disease or impact animals in any way. And I should probably just mention that on, and in some of the other sessions, they may have talked about host specificity. And I mentioned this with Daisy Uretinia, that tapeworm that's only found in devils, is that some species of parasites are very host specific and you can only find them, say, in certain animals, whereas others have a broad host range. And for Cryptosporidium, some parasites, some species of Cryptosporidium are very host specific. So for example, those marsupial species, whereas others such as Cryptosporidium parvum can be found in a whole range of animals, including cows, um, bats, uh, people, and so forth. Okay, so, so it's called host specificity. So we can also do, look at the DNA and compare um, our Cryptosporidium samples that we got from Tasmanian devils to other Cryptosporidium species. Then we can put it in a, in a little um, program, I guess, and ask the DNA to, strands to this program to compare the DNA strands from parasites 
from different animal species. And so what we've got on this slide is what we would term an evolutionary tree of cryptosporidium from Tasmanian devils. And basically you can see that we found a couple of known species of cryptosporidium in our devils in the study. So here, cryptosporidium fairi, which we've already detected in other marsupials. And on the slide, you can see it's the one at the top. Um, and you can see that we found that in one wild devil and the little image of the kangaroo next to the slide showing that this species is also present in kangaroos. If you look to the very bottom of the slide, we found two additional species, Cryptosporidium galli and Cryptosporidium murus. These species are common in rodents and birds, and rodents and birds are actually um, form diet components of Tasmanian devils. So it's not um, unlikely that we would find these there because they may just be passing through their food item and being detected in their poo, so not necessarily an infection. But what we did find was an entirely new species of Cryptosporidium in both wild and captive devils. And we found it in a good number, like th um, 38 animals that we looked at were carrying this cryptosporidium type and so we still need to go on and determine um, other factors about this cryptosporidium to describe it as a new parasite species from Tasmanian devils and to find out whether it's in other species or only specifically found in Tasmanian devils. So another parasite that we looked at was Giardia and we were here interested in asking um, the same question is there a difference in carriage of Giardia between uh, Tasmanian devils that are in the wild or, or in those uh, captive situations? And what we can see definitely, we have low numbers of parasites in animals that are in captivity versus the wild. And again, we can do that genetic study. Um, and on the slide, you can see the tree again, but this is for Giardia. And then right down the bottom, you can see that similar to Cryptosporidium, we actually found new types of Giardia in Tasmanian devils as well, which was great for us. You know, we're finding um, more diversity and, and more parasites and really understanding um, the types of parasites that are present in wildlife in Australia. But then right up the top there, you can see that we also found a Giardia type that typically occurs in humans and, and it's another aspect of the research that we're doing is to try and understand what we would term reverse zoonoses or the transmission of pathogens or parasites that are typically associated with humans to our wildlife. So we hear a lot about zoonoses and particularly now given COVID, so a virus that has emerged from a wildlife species, but here we can have the reverse <coughs> excuse me, um, where parasites of, and of humans can get into our wildlife and may have an impact there as well. So that really brings me to the end of my talk. And um, so what our study has shown so far, you know, we know we have this elusive parasite called Daisy Uretina robusta, a tapeworm in Tasmanian devils. We're doing some, or de trying to develop some t tests and using museum specimens to see if we can find a DNA signature for that parasite. And then we can go out and start screening our um, Tasmanian devils to see if we can find it in certain areas, find that DNA signature. And then we can kind of work up from the DNA instead of, instead of working from the parasite down to the DNA. Um, and so it would be really great if we could make that happen. But we're, we've been in lockdown, so we haven't really been working on our museum samples for a while. It's also interesting that our research has shown that we have new species of protozoan parasites, Cryptosporidium and Giardia. And, um, you know, further studies are required on those to determine whether they're specific to Tasmanian devils or found in other marsupials. And then who knows? <coughs> oh, I'm losing my voice, I apologise. Who knows, um, maybe there might be more parasites in Tasmanian devils that we need to conserve to preserve the biodiversity of parasites around the world. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Stephanie Godfrey and today I'm going to be talking a bit about parasite biodiversity in marsupials. So marsupials are most well known for the fact they have pouches and there's lots of them in Australia. But I think they should also be known for the immense parasite biodiversity they host too. So as an example, this is a swamp wallaby and 23 species of nematode have been described from these wallabies. There's one species in the esophagus, 16 species in the stomach and 8 species that occupy the gastrointestinal tract. And within the stomach alone, your average swamp wallaby has 20,000 worms, which is a huge abundance and diversity of parasites inside these, these marsupials. So marsupials could be considered little hopping biodiversity hotspots for parasites. Today I want to talk about the woolly also known as the brush-tailed betong, and they're a small marsupial. They were once widely distributed across the southern half of Australia, but after European arrival, their distributions became severely restricted after habitat loss, introduction of predators, and so on. Now they occur in the southwest of Western Australia, and back in the 1970s, their populations started to decline there. These declines were largely attributed to foxes and so a large amount of work went into controlling foxes and this was really successful and led to uh, whaley populations um, rebounding and it was so successful in fact they were taken off the endangered species list. But sadly the story doesn't stop there. Um, whaleys started to decline again back in the early 2000s and while predators such as foxes and cats are important um, in these declines, the magnitude of decline that was observed couldn't be explained by predators alone. And so disease was thought to maybe be involved in these declines. So at the time, a lot of research went into trying to find out what parasites and diseases whaleys had. And so in this diagram here, this is essentially a list of the parasites that are known from whaleys so far. And in total, there's 37 parasite species that are known to um, infect whaleys. We have ectoparasites on the left and endoparasites on the right. And those that are highlighted in yellow are thought to be host specific. And you'll notice among the ectoparasites, there's actually a tick, Ixodes whaleyi, which is, as far as we know, host specific. It only occurs on woilies and, and nothing else. And so they too are little biodiversity hotspots for parasites. Coming back to the decline, among the parasites that were found, um, one group in particular that was particularly interesting from the perspective of the decline, and these are trypanosomes. So trypanosomes are blood parasites. They live in the bloodstream of the woilies and they are transmitted from one woolly to another through an, a, a vector. And for these trypanosomes, we think maybe ticks are involved. Um, and trypanosomes are known to have pathogenic potential. So other members of this group of parasites cause sleeping sickness in humans. So at least three species, probably more, um, of trypanosomes infect woolies. And the two pictured here, Trypanosoma copemani on the left and Vagrandus on the right, are the ones that most commonly infect whalies. Of these two, Trypanosoma copemani is particularly interesting, and that's because they've been found to be capable of infecting tissues, and pathological lesions in dead whalies look um, very similar to those that we see in humans infected with trypanosomes. So we were able to look at uh, blood samples that were collected from a whaley population that was declining and we looked at how trypanosome infection patterns varied as the whaley population declined. And we had a couple of key findings. So one is that trypanosome acopmini was far more common in this declining whaley population than Vagrandus. And for both parasites on their own, Copmini and Vagrandus, their infection levels declined as the woolly population declined. But the interesting thing was that even though our woolly population was declining, the proportion of hosts that had both of these parasites actually increased. So even though we're losing hosts from this system, the hosts that are remaining had a higher proportion of those hosts were infected with both Copmini and Vingrandus at the same time. 
And so this was a bit puzzling, um, but one, we've come up with one explanation for why we might observe that. And that is that maybe these parasites are interacting with each other. So take an example where Copeman eye is in a woylie on its own. And so it's replicating away and it's got nothing really to control it, which means that the more it replicates, the, the more negative impacts it has on its host. But if Copeman eye is in a host with uh, Vagrandus, the other trypanosome, it suddenly can't replicate as much. It's got some competition within the host. And so that competition reduces the growth rates of Copenhagen, and maybe for Grandis as well, meaning that neither parasite can kind of grow out of control and, and therefore by having two parasites in the same host, they might actually reduce the overall effect that those parasites have on their host. So this is just a hypothesis, but it would explain what we observed, where we see co-infections be become more common in the woolly population as the woolly population declines. And I think it highlights the importance of thinking about the whole parasite biodiversity within a host and how those parasites might be interacting. So because the woolies are declining, um, they have been a focus of significant conservation um, management. And one of the key conservation management tools for woolies are translocations. So when we pick animals up and move them around, we are probably moving their parasites with them. But we know very little about how that changes host parasite communities and what parasites we might be losing or gaining through doing this. And so we were involved in three translocations where we moved wheelies from a sanctuary into three different sites and essentially we tracked their parasite communities after the translocation. And this work was largely uh, done by a PhD student at the time, Amy Northover. And so what happened to their parasites? So firstly, let's take a look at our trypanosomes. On the left, we have Trypanosoma copemani. This is the one we think is maybe pathogenic. And each of the different colored lines shows a different site where the woylies were translocated. And what we see amongst this jumble of lines is that each site seems to be doing something quite different. So Dryandra, for instance, the black line maintains a relatively high prevalence of Copemani, and the other two sites sort of jump around quite a lot. The Grandis shows a similar thing where we see that each of the sites sort of do their more or less their own thing. Each of the sites ends up with a, a different prevalence, so a different proportion of hosts that are infected with that parasite. And we see a similar pattern when we look at gastrointestinal parasites, and these are just a couple of examples. On the left we have strong giles, on the right we have coccidia, both gastrointestinal parasites. And the red arrow is the point at translocation, and then we have July and September, so after the translocation. And again we see a similar pattern where the two sites this time that we're looking at the, the parasites end up doing quite different things depending on the site that they the hosts went into. And so it could be that there's different environmental conditions at those sites, different densities of hosts, maybe different alternative hosts within that community that might be shaping these host parasite communities. And ultimately what we see um, in these translocated woolly populations is quite different um, parasite communities emerging and, and those communities become more similar to the resident woolies that are in those places. And so when we move woilies, we do change their host parasite communities. And we're looking at more research to understand exactly how they change and what parasites we might be losing, as well as which ones we're gaining. So I'd like to thank you all for listening, and I hope you enjoy the rest of Parasite Biodiversity Day. Hey, Dr. Godfrey. <laughs> Hi, how's it going? Good. Thank you for joining us for this Q&A session. And once again, for our audience, if you have any questions for Dr. Stephanie Godfrey, please feel free to put them in the chat of the YouTube. So our first question here from audience, Sandra Vila, asked, 
How do you handle the animals to take the parasite samples? Do you put them euthanasia or euthanasia? <laughs> Good question. Um, so we, I guess we try not to if we can get away with it. And a lot of the parasites that we're looking at, we can um, measure from their poo, basically. So when we trap the animals, uh, they usually enter the trap overnight and then um, when we catch them the next day there's usually a lot of poo in the trap and so we can measure their gastrointestinal parasites that way um, and for their blood parasites we take a, a blood sample from the tail so um, usually we can get that without having to put them under anesthesia so yeah good question thank you and the uh, next question was your discovery of both parasites being present in the wallace something you have seen in other hosts? Oh, oh, good, good question. question. Um, so I guess, I mean, one of the challenges is we tend, when we're looking at parasites, sometimes we're, we sort of just look at one parasite and we tend to not look at the others. So co-infection is something that we don't think about as much as maybe we should. I think with the trypanosomes, um, there has been, there's been a lot of people working on them and, and we're discovering more and more the diversity of blood parasites um, that occur in, in our marsupials in Australia. But yeah, it's something that we tend not to think about too much, but potentially is quite important. So yeah, good question. Thank you. And we also have Dr. Michelle Power joining us. Hi, Michelle. Uh, hello, hello everyone. <laughs> hello, it's Danny. Hi, Michelle. <laughs> we have a question from Michelle as well. Uh, as, uh, a question from Sandra. It's about Toxoplasma gondii. It's a marsupial capable of exerting oocysts. Uh, if so, are they infective? Uh, so the marsupials don't produce the oocysts, okay? Only cats can produce the oocysts of toxoplasma. So cats are what we term the definitive host where those infective stages are produced. Uh, marsupials are kind of accidental hosts. So, so yeah. Thank you. And a question for both presenters. Is host specificity of cryptosporidium or the exodus host dependent, so host specific immunity, or do they think it's more associated with spatial or environmental constraints? Who wants to go first? Sorry. Was, was, was that, that host specificity, specificity of cryptosporidium? Yes. Is, is it associated with the host or the environment? environment? Was that, that the, the question? question? I also put it in the chat here. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah, okay. 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 Yeah. okay. So, so I can, can talk, talk to cryptosporidium. No, it's definitely associated with the host. Okay. Uh, so the uh, cryptosporidium has marsupial specific species that are only found in marsupials. There are some reports of those species found in people. So um, zoonoses or transmission from animals to humans. Uh, but also there is some environmental constraint because marsupials are mainly in Australia. And so for what we know, um, those species are present in Australian marsupials, but one of them has been found in the opossum in North America. And I guess um, to add to that, the, the ticks, the exodes that are host specific to the woolly, um, I guess we don't really know why they're host specific, but one of our thoughts is maybe to do with the behavior of the woolly and its nesting habitat. Um, is quite specific to any of the other marsupials that live in those environments. So that's going to influence the way that that tick can get from one host to the other. But it's possible it's something to do with the host as well. And, and maybe that, that tick has specialised in some way that it can um, persist on the woolly. So again, it, I guess similar to crypto um, spiridium in that it's probably a bit of both in environment and, and behavior and ecology as, as well as um, the, the parasite adapting to its host. Thank you. And a question from Dr. Chorsk uh, asked our both presenters, 
Do marsupials differ from a placental mammals in their immune response? For example, look whole set cells involved, cytokines, timeline of responses, and so on. Who wants to go first? Do you have anything <laughs> to say, Steph? I have nothing. <laughs> I have no idea, Michelle. Okay. Yeah, look, I don't have much to say either. I'm not an immunologist. <laughs> parasitologist. Uh, I do know that um, what I can say is I do know that there's a lot of information out there on the production of antimicrobial peptides in the pouches of marsupials to protect the juveniles in those early stages of life. Um, look, my memory is catching at me to say there are, is some variation in the immune response, but, but I think it's minor tweaks here or there. Um, I still think it's pretty standard innate um, and, and active immune responses like in placentals. So sorry, I can't quite answer that either. <laughs> and you want to add Dr. Godfrey? No, I think Michelle did a great job. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> so the next question is to you, Stephanie. Mm, it's from Sarah Valeria asked, do you know the prevalence of parasite co-infection in Wallace? Ah, good question. Um, so I'm just trying to think back to my presentation. Um, I mean, in terms of the trypanosomes, I think the, the rates of co-infection were certainly not super high. It was probably uh, somewhere around the, the either 20 to 40 percent. Um, and in Whaley's in general, I mean, I'm, you know, we we know that woolies are infected by more than one parasite. So, you know, they've got trypanosomes, but they've got gastrointestinal parasites as well as ectoparasites. And, and so most woolies would be carrying more than one of um, those things. So, so yeah, so I, I would certainly say it's probably um, a large majority would be carrying multiple parasites. Um, yeah. Thank you. And for our last question is to Michelle from Sandra. If you find an unknown cosidia, what's the next step? Do you make a molecular analysis? Yeah, exactly. So if we if we um, we did, I mentioned in the talk that we did identify some coccidia that were, we think are unknown. There's no previous reports of coccidia in Tasmanian devils, um, and so we can we. You saw there was a photo of an oasis there, so we can do morphology on that. But then we would purify those out of the sample and do the molecular test to work out the sequence, which would then tell us what genus it belonged to, whether it's a new species or not. So that would exactly be the path that we would take to try and uncover a mysterious parasite like that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Power and Dr. Godfrey again for the presentation and answering questions. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. So in the interest of time, this is the end of our Parasite and Host Animals with Poultry session. And we'll take a three minutes break before we continue to our next session, Parasites and Arts, with Dr. William Campbell's interview and the Maguro Parasitological Museum in Japan. See you soon. Thank you for organizing all of Hi, Shen Wa Li. Um, I'm Bill Campbell, and I'm very happy to have this opportunity to talk to you, uh, not about my work in science, but my play in the arts. My, so I'm talking about my amateur side. blew their up
331 unique viewers. So I'm following all the stats because I'm a nerd like that. So. Uh, hey everyone, thank you for coming back or hello if you're just joining us. This is our fourth and last session of this second day of the Parasite, uh, Parasite Biodiversity Day event presented by the Global Parasitologist, uh, Parasitologist, Parasitologist <laughs> Coalition. Sorry, I can't say things now. Uh, we're happy to present this session about parasites and arts. First, we're very excited to share our uh, exclusive interview of the 2015 Nobel laureate, Dr. William Campbell. You're about to see his amazing parasite paintings, hear him talk about the story behind his art and parasite studies, as well as his perspective on how art and science inspires one another. Then we will take you on an immersive curator's tour of the Magro Parasitological Museum in Japan. Learn how parasitic disease have been associated with arts in Japan, such as the famous Jikenchi Numata parasites wax models, paintings from traditional Japan, and more. But unfortunately, we will not have a Q&A session after this art session. But we hope you enjoy this section about parasites and arts. I'm talking about my amateur side. And Hi, Shenmue Lee. Um, I'm Bill Campbell, and I'm very happy to have this opportunity to talk to you, uh, not about my work in science, but my the arts. My, so I'm talking about my amateur side. And it's very nice to do that. This is one, obviously, about the liver fluke, and viola. Uh, and the main feature is a rose window with the flukes arranged around this window. Uh, and those are the adult flukes. And then the thing in the center of the rose window is the infective metasacarial stage. Mm -hmm. so, but the thing about it is that it is not strictly conventional. And in the upper left-hand corner, you have a, a sense in, in blue there, upper left-hand corner of, of stonework, because this, after all, would be a rose window in a facade. Um, and so that represents the stonework in which the rose window. But then as you get over to the lower right, yeah. You see things become shimmery and it becomes watery and becomes water in which the intermediate snail host lives. Mm -hmm. So it sort of um, is a mixture of um, science and fiction, so to speak. And uh, it's uh, the uh, aquatic snail and, and the host in this um, and that's what I like to do, is do something different. I mean, I could just paint a picture of a fluke and a snail, um, but I rather think of something um, that inspires me, and, and I'm inspired by something. I'm inspired by seeing the road window, and I think, gosh, those things around the thing, uh, around this, the, the periphery of the window, look to me like the shape of a fasciola. And so then I go away and I make a rose window that's got my flukes in it instead of what was in the original window. Mm -hmm. So that's the fun of it. That's one of my favorite flukes. It's the one that got me interested in parasitology to begin with. Oh, really? Uh, so it's one that's very important to me. And so to work on it, I always considered a privilege and I learned about it 
very on, of course, long before I had a chance to work on it. And it was many years before I had a chance to work on it. And when I did, I set it up with mud bank snails, not knowing any better, and coming from the British Isles, uh, I, I, I think it was called Limnia truncatula, uh -huh. mud bank snail. And uh, I spent a lot of hours trying to make mud banks in my lab. And that's a very difficult thing to do. And then I discovered, of course, that there were other fully aquatic snails uh, that were very good hosts. And uh, so uh, <laughs> that problem was solved. If I had just known, or if I'd had a, a colleague or a supervisor who knew about the uh, fully aquatic snails, that would have saved me a lot of trouble. Yes, and that was a very classic life cycle. That was one of the historic parasite life cycles. Uh, and the slope goes back to medieval times when, when shepherds, uh, certainly shepherds in the, what's now the United Kingdom, knew about rotten sheep um, and the, the little flocks or flukes that looked to them like little fish. And then the life cycle was worked out by a man in England and a man in New Zealand, and it was a very historic um, elucidation of a life cycle. Yes, and, and so that's an important point. I do not try and make them scientific illustrations. So they're, they're definitely not scientific illustrations. Mm -hmm. And that's very important. Um, mm. So I just change them as the you know, whatever I feel like. No, it's always done from my head. Oh, wow. It's, it's never from looking at a, at a particular fluke or anything. It's, uh, it's just my imagination or my, uh, well, I'll, sometimes I'll have a diagram or something, but um, most of the time, well, I start off doing it strictly from my head and then Sometimes I have to look up something, but no, it's very important to realize that they're not scientific illustrations. So they cannot be used uh, for teaching purposes. And that is an example of, you know, it's obviously a matter, it's a work of imagination. <laughs> um, I like to imagine tapeworms forming themselves into a double helix. But oh. of course, we all know that they don't do that in real life. <laughs> Um, but that's the fun of it. And so, but then there's a sort of fairly realistic school X of a uh, tinea solium. Yeah. And uh, then on the framework at the back, there are suggestions of, of cysticerci of different sizes mm -hmm. on, suggested on lab structures. Um, so again, that's um just an imaginary thing mm -hmm. so my, my idea is to do something colorful yeah and imaginative and uh, provocative sometimes mm -hmm. um, but the main thing is um not scientific illustration for example in the school X with the yeah. large hooks and small hooks mm -hmm. i do not know or care if i've got the exact right number mm -hmm. So they should not, definitely not be used for teaching because I want to give a visual impression. Um, and I think in a way, uh, this one is maybe more realistic than a lot of photographs you see in books because you frequently see tapeworms, especially those scolex and the neck region as all wrinkled and wizened. Yeah. Um, I think you see a lot of artific uh, artifact um, as a result of processing of specimens. Um, and uh, I have seen tapeworms alive in a petri dish and uh, they, they look, you know, much smoother and, and nicer than after they've been put through fixatives and generally mistreated. I started painting these pictures um, a few years after 1960 or so, I started probably around 1965 or something like that. 
I had always wanted to paint, um, even as a kid, but I, I didn't continue through a life painting. I just stopped and had family and a career and, you know, stopped for, for more than you're alive. I mean, for, <laughs> for, for you know, decades. And, um, but I wanted to, I always had that desire to paint. And so I started with another, before I was married, another guy and I, he was an engineer. Um, and so we were both very much non-artists, but we agreed that we wanted to start painting. So we just started, we went out together, we bought paints, we started painting. And so um, that was 1960 mm -hmm. and I painted. And the trouble was that I had no theme and I had no style because I hadn't been painting mm -hmm. and I had no passion to paint anything in particular. So I was making copies of famous paintings, many of which I still have, um, you know, really, you know, sort of big copies of famous paintings. Um, so I did copying uh, from books and that was frustrating because I was painting, which I wanted to do in my spare time. Mm -hmm. But I had no, no theme, no, nothing driving me. And then as it happened, just by chance, the American, American Society of Parasitologists, yeah. American Society of Parasitologists started having annual auctions. And they would have people bringing things. If the meeting was in Boston, somebody would bring a can of Boston baked beans, or somebody would bring a piece of cloth from some exotic country. Anyway, all kinds of stuff people were bringing. And the auction was a huge success and a great social aspect of the parasitology meetings, because you would have the before dinner or cocktail hour, have a big auction. Um, and it suddenly occurred to me that maybe I could make a painting and bring it the next year, which I did, but then I was very scared as to whether or not I should be at the auction in case nobody bid for my painting. And so I, uh, anyway, I, I know which painting it was, um, but it was bought by a Korean medical scientist mm -hmm. and that was the beginning that started it. And I've been contributing paintings ever since to the parasitology auction. And it has just, that's one of the motivations, apart from the fact that I enjoy painting, mm -hmm. one of the great motivations is that it's a great fundraiser mm -hmm. uh, because it really, people, sometimes people are in the audience who have discovered a particular parasite, especially mm -hmm. say a tapeworm. And then it happens that they see that tapeworm in one of my paintings. Yeah. So they're very interested in buying that painting. So I have a sort of a captive audience, except of course, I don't know ahead of time what they're going to discover. <laughs> but uh, when they discover a painting and it's published, then sometimes it inspires me to incorporate it in a painting. Mm -hmm. So often I have paintings with many tapeworms, for example, in one painting, many scholarships. Yeah. And uh, sometimes people have a particular interest in some particular one. So it's, anyway, that's been a huge motivation and a huge satisfaction for me to do this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't for the pandemic, I would be doing it still. Mm -hmm. um, so. So you kind of stopped doing it lately because of COVID? Well, I, I haven't stopped except for the time business. I have problems finding the time to paint, which is very frustrating, but the, the Nobel Prize really destroyed my, my retirement. Oh, yeah. <laughs> not, that I'm, not that I'm complaining, mind you, but it's still, I, you know, my life has just become incredibly busy. So I have a hard time finding time to paint, but I'm still doing it when I can. No, that's called a worm monster. Uh, you see, it has schistosome eggs as sort of eyes. It's, um, uh, let's see, it's, ah. it's, um, yeah, schistosome eggs as yeah. eyes. 
Um, it's not, of course, an, a creature, but it, uh, my idea was that it was sort of a monster. Uh -huh. um, and with these horns coming out at the top of its head that are tapeworms. Yeah. And then there's Fasciola right in the middle. Oh, yeah. Fasciola hepatica. Uh -huh. And more tapeworms beside, on either side of Fasciola. And yeah. then there's Trichinella larva here. Uh -huh. And at that time I was working, 19, I would have been working on trichinella, among other things. I did a lot of work in trichinella. This is an assisted trichinella larva. Mm -hmm. um, and then there, Shakiri, uh, fork tailed, just a some type Shakiri, I guess. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, this might be a Fasciola Shakiri. And this is uh, the tri lobed anterior end of Ascaris. Um, the uh, very uh, these uh, fatty lips on the front of an ascarid, and here, well, here's the here's the schistosome couple. This one is strange in that, well, here is the hookworm, and in this case, it's sort of suggestive of Ancelostoma, uh -huh. um, not the hair. And uh, certainly those, uh, in those two things are, are not very accurate. So, well, of course, again, the whole thing is not a scientific illustration. So it's not supposed to be accurate. It's supposed to be the way I want it to look. Yes. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the sole, the sole uh, determinant of how it should look. But this is a big tapeworm in the background, as you hear, this big blue tapeworm. Oh, the blue thing, yeah. Um, and that's a theme that I had a whole, they had a whole series that had that sort of big curved tapeworm as a feature. Um, and then hookworm, and these are hookworm eggs. And this on the left is the hookworm, um, uh, what you call the reproductive thing at the end of a, that kind of nematode. The, uh, there's an expanded cuticle part, copulatory bursa, that's what it is, the copulatory bursa mm -hmm. that has these sort of thickened rays in it, but this whole thing is the copulatory bursa that the, the, worm, the male has for copulation purposes, mm -hmm. for, for grasping the female worm. So that's the hookworm eggs and both the and mouth part and the posterior part so and that's why I'm, I'm this may not be the best example of uh, nematode certainly i paint many many fewer paintings of tapeworms of um, nematodes because they don't have the great morphological diversity of tapeworms and then there's something here um these i guess must be uh, the tapeworm eggs they don't look very realistic, though. And then this um, looks like, I think, a cysticircus, <laughs> shapeless cyst that, that gets shaped whenever, you know, it's a soft, yeah. soft membrane uh, cyst. Sometimes there is something, but often it's just a visual um, yeah. impact that I want to make. So I, it's, I want to make a bold, statement um, and a, a colorful pattern, but a, a bold colorful pattern, if that makes sense. And that's really, that's really the objective. It's uh, very seldom carries any message. Uh, well, it's certainly, I, I enjoy tapeworms by far the most. And, uh, I well, I think Tini Asolium was the one I enjoy painting most, and I've painted a lot of pictures of Tini Asolium. Mm -hmm. Well, it's challenging for one thing <laughs> with a hooklet, um, and it's sort of dramatic. Uh -huh. I think it's a very dramatic yeah. tapeworm, and. Um, but basically, it's it's a very much a visual 
thing. And for me, and this is one of the things that I, I was going to get into, um, mm -hmm. for me, painting is not a hobby. Are you familiar with the term hobby? Mm -hmm. As a, a thing that people do that is sort of an escape from their work, you know, a little so. Um, a scientist might do woodwork in the evenings or something like that. Um, and so a lot of people have a hobby or an avocation. Mm -hmm. And it is, in many cases, a need to get away from the regular work to provide relief. Um, if you're doing sort of engineering working all day, and then you want to have in your evenings, you want to have a hobby of, of uh, woodworking or whatever. Um, but for me, this is very different because I don't do it to escape from parasites because I like parasites. I'm not trying to find relief from parasites, but I am trying to find um, a way to blend my science and my art. Um, historically, um, most people with sort of double interests or multiple pursuits are trying desperately to keep them separate, totally separate. And I'm not, I, I want to bring my parasites with me into my avocation, you know, from my vocation to my avocation. I want to keep them with me. So in a way, I'm trying to make a blend, blending of science and art, not a separation. So it's not being done, in my case, to find relief from my regular work. It is to make use and incorporate my regular work into my art interest. Mm -hmm. That's a major thing. I mean, historically, as you know, there are you know, many examples of people doing multiple things. Often in the case of artists and actors, it's to, to make enough money to stay alive so that they're, you know, actors are doing, or waiters and waitresses and so on. Um, and in some cases, uh, writers are painters. The composer Philip Glass is a plumber, um, but, in some cases it's to earn money and in some cases it's just to provide relief but in the case of of anton chekhov the russian playwright um he uh was a medical doctor had a regular he was a regular medical practitioner um and uh, he kept the two interests completely apart so that's one of the things that that is important to me, that instead of trying to keep them apart, I'm trying to happily bring them together. Well, for me it is, um, because it means that I'm not, um, I, I'm not discarding um, what I do during the day, I'm not, getting away from it because I don't want to get away from it because I, I've liked parasites all my life. Um, and so I'm, uh, some people might think it was excessively <laughs> compulsive being interested in something. Uh, and I do have other interests in, in poetry and writing and the creative arts um, in general, but um, when it comes to painting, this is an opportunity for me to uh, unite them in a, what I hope is a productive way. And unexpectedly, as I mentioned, it turned out to be a great opportunity to have fun and raise funds for scholarships, for parasitologies, uh, raise money for parasitology scholarships. So there are many, models for doing it. But anyway, the one thing I, did, I was trying to bring out was the fact that I'm trying to blend my science and my art. And that is that it seems to me that we all have a need to do things and, and make things. 
uh, to explore, um, it's, I suppose, creativity, but that sort of sounds like it's something very fancy and special, whereas what I'm talking about is something we all have, and uh, exploration is a big part of it. And when we're babies crawling on the floor, we don't just crawl on the corner of the room where we've put on the floor. We, we want to go and get to the crawl to the middle of the room. We want to go to the other corner. We just, the innate, the innate drive to do stuff, uh, make stuff, see stuff, find stuff. And so the idea is to try and um, preserve as much of that as we grow up as possible. So I think one of the reasons I do uh, things like painting as well as science is just this need to do things that are new, sort of exploration. To me, it's sort of both of these are adventures in exploration, both the painting and the science. And um, the one of the reasons for doing painting as well as science is just the need to do something different. I think we need variety in our lives. And uh, but that gets back to the question of, of people having multiple interests. But I think that's something we all um, we all have. And in my case, if I'm going to do something different from my science, um, one of the appeals of painting is that it's messy and disorderly, whereas the science, the whole point of the science is to be orderly. Uh -huh, yeah. Messy at times, but, but the objective is to be orderly and to bring order. I mean, even the science is, is, is messy while you're doing research, uh, it's in order to bring order to things. And whereas painting, you can, you can mess about, uh, so that's one of the appeals. And then within painting, then it seems to me there's a, a certain built-in variety. Uh, and I mentioned in the case of tapeworms, there are all these different structural varieties in the Scolex formation of tapeworms. So, but in all of the biology, you have this great built-in variety. Um, so it's, that's what uh, our <laughs> immense biodiversity gives us as an opportunity so that by, uh, you know, that's, that, that's where I find variety as well as difference in occupation. So Meguro Parasitological Museum is located in Meguroku, Tokyo, Japan. It is a unique museum specialized in parasites and parasitology. The collections of specimens and materials, uh, research, exhibitions, and education, all related to parasites and parasitology. The museum was founded in 1953 by Dr. Satoru Kamegai to develop people's knowledge of parasitology and public health using his private property. The present building was completed in 1992 and the new exhibition opened in 1993. The museum is now recognized as a Public Interest Incorporated Foundation. On the first floor, we exhibit the diversity of parasites. Parasites are distributed on various branches of tree of life, showing that adaptations to parasitism occurred repeatedly during the course of animal evolution. The meaning of parasitism, the morphological characteristics of parasites, and the life cycles of parasites are explained. The diversity of parasites are demonstrated by real specimens, arranged in the taxonomic groups, 
namely protozoans, cnidarians, monogenians, flukes, tapeworms, leeches, and even plastic clams. On the other side of central displacement, nematodes, acanthus varans, ticks, lice, and crustaceans are displayed. This display features diplozoid monogenians. Studies on new diplozoan Nipponikan was life work of Dr. Satoru Kamegai, the founder of this museum. And this parasite species is also used as the logo of the museum. Major human parasites are also introduced by specimen and illustration, indicating their site of infestation. We carry out a special exhibition every year. In 2021, we focusing on plastic marine snails, demonstrating their diversity and origins. This exhibition was directed by one of the researchers at the museum, Dr. Tsuyoshi Takano. In the second floor, we exhibit human and zoonotic parasites. In human parasites, the pinworms, landworms of the genus Ascaris, hookworms, Filarial worms and tapeworms of the genus Tenia are displayed. On the other side of the display case is human zoonotic trematodes, an intestinal fluke of the genus Metagonimus, liver flukes Fasciola and Chronorchis, lung flukes Paragonimus, and blood flukes schistosoma are displayed. This is a broad tape worm, Dipotriocephalus nihonkaiensis, 8.8 .8 meters long from a human. This specimen was collected by Dr. Satoru Kamegai in 1986 from a patient at his own clinic. This is an exhibition of human zoonotic parasites transmitted mainly via companion animals. This shows dog heartworms, toxoplasma species found in dog rats and cats, toxoplasma, and cestose species of the genus Dipyridium, Echinococcus, and Spirometra. This is an exhibition of human zoonotic nematodes. Anisakiasis is very common and furious for Japanese people due to the habit of eating raw fish. Adult worms from mink fur are displayed, as well as a third stage larvae from squid and fish, that are the ecological agent of human anisakiasis. On the other hand, we exhibit wax model made by Jin Kishinumata. He was a technician at the Kitazato Institute, a medical research facility, and he donated these models of parasites, parasite eggs, insects, and mites in 1956, immediately after the opening of this museum. We also exhibit the history of parasitology in Japan. We feature Dr. Sachu Yamaguchi, a most important parasitologist in the development of parasitology in Japan. He described about 1400 species of parasites from wild animals, 
and published more than 80 paper and books. In this room, some of his specimens, drawings used for his publications, his microscope and his handmade textbook are displayed. You can also compare the specimens with its drawing. Finally, we will invite you to the medium shop. There you can find a range of distinctive and original items and current publications on parasitology. In the basement, we maintain about 43,000 issues of reprints, over 5,200 of books, and about 300 titles of journals. In the storage section, we also preserve about 60,000 specimens of parasites and their host including 10,000 specimens from Dr. Sachu Yamaguchi's collection. This collection includes specimens on slides and preserved in liquid. Of them, 4,000 specimens of 2,000 species are type specimens. Thank you for your attention, Megaloprocytological Museum. Parasite and Arts, presented by Megaloprocytological Museum, MPM, will present this program of five topics. The first topic is plastic disease shown in Japanese arts. This picture shows a noble woman suffering from elephantiasis due to lymphatic filariasis. This is found on, in an old picture scroll from the late 20th century, which records many kinds of diseases. The picture is also well known worldwide since it was used on a cover of the WHO pamphlet about the program to eradicate lymphatic filariasis. This is a woodblock print showing another case of lymphatic filariasis, scrotal edema, by the famous ukiyo-e artist Hokusai Katsushika in Edo period in the 19th century. Among his best-known works was a 36 view of Mount Fuji, but his Hokusai sketchbook were also popular in this time. This picture is from another picture scroll issued in 1850 in the period, showing blood tape from infection. This picture scroll is thought to have been drawn in imitation of the above-mentioned late 20th century scroll. This is an ukiyo-e print issued in 1883 in the Meiji period featuring a vision of the shogun Kiyomori Tairano awaiting judgment on his wickedness in life by Yamaraja, a deity of the world and the world. The shogun died of fever said to be due to malaria. The second topic is wax model of parasites made by Jinkichi Numata. Numata was first employed by the Institute of Infectious Diseases as an assistant to a parasitologist, Professor Dr. Mikinosuke Miyajima, in 1906. 
and he accompanied the professor to the International Hygiene Exhibition in Dresden, Germany in 1911. At that time, wax models such as dermatology murages were so essential for medical and public health education that Numata stayed in Germany for four years to learn wax modeling techniques. Eventually, such models lost their teaching role as technology progressed, but their importance is now rediscovered as a component of medical and cultural history. After returning to Japan, Numata worked in Kisasato Institute Medical Research Facility as a technician and supported medical research and education behind the scenes for many years. MPM reserved 30 wax models that were donated by Numata himself for exhibition, and other 15 are in Kisasato Institute, Kisasato Memorial Museum. If one compares wax model to a real parasite, one may be amazed at the skill of the artist. The next topic is original drawing of Dr. Satyu Yamaguchi's papers. He was a pioneer in the taxonomy of parasites and described over 1,400 new species of parasites, including helminths, crustaceans, and even mosquitoes. He drew specimens with a pencil using a monocular microscope equipped with an Abbe's camera lucida. He employed several assistants and his sketches were handed over to them. They traced the sketches and finished them with fine brushes like artworks. This is a drawing of Cephalopolis Moracanti from a thread sail firefish, showing a close-up view of the Cyrus pouch, testes, and uterus. This is a drawing of Carotomus japonicus from a Japanese parrotfish, showing close-up view of Cyrus pouch, testes, ovary, seminal receptacle, and uterus. This is an example of drawings of mosquito, Aedes haxanensis. This plate is from Studies on the Helmets Fauna of Japan, Part 24, issued in 1938, showing the monogenium of marine fishes. One of the monogenian species, Microcoti the Thai, from a red sea bream is shown with close-up view of the posterior and anterior ends. This is also from the same issue, showing a didymazoids. Here is a focus is on one dismodoid species, Diprotrema pyramidis, from a skipjack tuna. It is characterized by two individuals enclosed in a cyst and four fused at the posterior part of the hind body. Close up views of the vitellian gland, two oral suckers, testis, and uterus are shown. The most of all Yamaguchi's figures are preserved in MPM. The next topic is base work of parasites by Ms. Mayumi Kronuma. She is a remarkable modern artist, highly inspired by beauty of parasite specimens exhibited in MTM, and especially this broad paper, the Potrigasephalus nifonkaiensis. 
This specimen prompted, prompted her to start knitting parasites in her own way. These blocks were created by measuring the broad tapeworm cell fertilization and how broad tapeworm live in human intestine. She developed a unique knitting technique combining croquet and rot knitting named biological racing. It enabled her to create anatomically acceptable knitting of living organisms. This work is titled Our Inner Sea, a tribute to Dr. Isao Ijima. Professor Dr. Ijima of Tokyo Imperial University is one of the founders of the parasitology in Japan, and these organisms, cestos and grass sponges, are all related to Dr. Ijima's research. A private exhibition of myomicronuma, lace works of parasites, was held in December 2019 at MPM. Finally, we introduce our museum shop. Visitors can find these original goods designed by the MPM staff using parasites as design motifs. Items include rulers, bags, t-shirts, plastic file folders, mugs, and towels. Thank you for your attention. Megro Parasitological Museum. Hey everyone, welcome back and thank you for attending. We hope you enjoyed our Parasite and Art sections with Dr. William Campbell and the Magro Parasitological Museum. This event has truly been an incredible experience and we are proud to have been given the opportunity to share some of the aspects of parasitology. We would like to thank our awesome speakers and panelists, Dr. Matthew Bollock, Dr. Kevin Lafferty, Dr. Chelsea Wood, Dr. Michael Absley, Dr. Skylar Hopkins, Dr. Mackenzie Quack, Dr. Michelle Power and her colleagues, Dr. Stephanie Godfrey, Dr. William Campbell, and Dr. Karamuchi as well as the parasitologists who participated in our exclusive interview, Dr. Chelsea Wood, Dr. Kevin Lafferty, Dr. Mackenzie Quack, Dr. Shaw Shrakshi, uh, Dr. Ling Long, Dr. Gillian Detweiler, Dr. Kamara Goter, Dr. Matthew Bollock. Our thanks also goes to Dr. Kelly Winnersmith and Dr. Kazu Ogawa for their support and all the parasitologists who have supported us in other forms. Their time is very valuable, now more than ever, and we deeply appreciate their contributions that made these events possible. I would also like to thank the American Society of Parasitologists, the Australian Society for Parasitology, the Magro Parasitological Museum in Japan, and other organizations that have supported this event. And a very special thanks goes to Dr. William Campbell. Dr. Campbell was the very first parasitologist I interviewed for this event. His support and encouragement for the organization and the event has helped us to proceed with confidence since the beginning. We're grateful for his companion, uh, compassion for fellow researchers, enthusiasm, and achievement in the field. As Dr. Campbell once said, it is time for parasites to get a little more respect. 
We would also like to acknowledge the hard work from the people behind the scenes at the Global Parasitologist Coalition. This includes our science communication team who contribute in the production of the event and made sure that the materials were both scientifically accurate as well as appealing. We have Kyle Lassac, Eleanor Cherry, and Sun Wook and Mickey. Their engagements, uh, their engagements are partially funded by the Graduate Student Association here at the University of Calgary. Thanks for the generous support. We would also like to thank our experience development team that designed our original visual elements for this event, including our favorite posters for the event, and worked many long days uh, for the production of the interview and presentations. Our executive designer Xiao Xiao, who's not being able to make it today, and digital media producer Tian Yi Wang, and others. And a huge thank you to my husband Yuan Zhe Rock Wang, who is also our strate strategy and development consultant for the Global Parasitologist Coalition for all the hard work and support. The experience and communication development is also supported by Yishu Culture and Communication, LLC. As mentioned earlier, we're presenting this event in celebration the UN Biodiversity Conference, COP15, which is being hosted in Kunming, China this year. This is a time for us to celebrate and conserve biodiversity on Earth. We hope this Parasite Biodiversity event helped bring people's awareness to parasites, for people to appreciate the important roles parasites play in ecosystems, and also celebrate the biodiversity of parasite along with other organisms. Lastly, we would like to thank everyone who attended our event. This was our very first event and we are a startup team, so we are absolutely delighted with the turnout and engagement from the participants. We received many thought-provoking questions from our audience, which shows that they share the same passion for parasitology and science as we do. And we aim to bring more projects and events with parasitologists and organizations worldwide and pitch a collective voice that will help to bring public awareness to the field we all love, parasitology. Before we sign off for the night, we would like to invite the audience to subscribe our YouTube channel and to share your thoughts about the event on social media. We have more content planned for the future and would deeply appreciate your help in sharing with others and raising awareness. The playback for this event will be added for viewing experience. We will be releasing revised version of the presentations and the interview in the coming weeks on our YouTube channel and website. Furthermore, we have more parasitology education materials coming out that we are very excited about, including collectible parasite cards. Please stay tuned to our newsletter and social media for these. Finally, we would like to show our appreciation by awarding our Amazon gift card for $100 Canadian dollars. And so the winner we uh, chose randomly from all the registered participants. And the award goes to Courtney Ong from the Resin University. We will contact you through the email for the details. Thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day or afternoon or evening or night. Bye.